room. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon at the district office and the public is welcome to attend. Alternatively, the meeting may also be viewed on the district's YouTube channel where it is being live streamed. The meeting is being audio and video recorded and the recording may capture sounds and images of those attending this meeting. The recording will be posted on the district website. At this moment, I please invite you to um, stand with us and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Good evening and welcome. I'm Paula Viesquez, board president. To my right is Dr. Michael McKibben, board vice president. To his right is Ms. Zima Creason, our board clerk. To her right is Ms. Pam Costa and Mr. Saul Hernandez, board members. To my left is Superintendent Kern and to his left is board administrative assistant, Stephanie Cunningham. Before we begin, I'd like to review the two methods that are available to offer public comment for tonight's meeting. For those of you who are attending the board meeting in person and would like to offer a public comment on items that are not that are on the agenda rather we ask that you please complete a speaker card that is available over there near the door by mr allen mr allen thank you for raising your hand and you will be called on at the appropriate time during the agenda the second option is to submit a public comment online using the comment form located on the district website at www.sanjuan.edu slash board meeting. If you wish to submit a public comment on more than one agenda item, please submit a separate form for each item on which you are commenting. Comments received by 6 p.m. today have already been shared with all board members. However, for the series of special meetings regarding the CVRA process, we will also read aloud comments submitted prior to 6 p.m. after public comment for those of us who are here in person. Comments received after 6 p.m. tonight, including those submitted during the meeting, may be read during the meeting depending on time restrictions. Comments may only be submitted on an agenda item up until the item that the agenda item, uh, up until the time, rather, that the agenda item has been discussed. Please note that all public comments are subject to a two minute limit or approximately 1500 characters. Public comments regarding items that are not on the agenda should be offered during the next regular board meeting scheduled for August 10th. We are now at item B, approval of the minutes. Are there any corrections to the minutes? Okay, seeing none. Is there a motion to approve the minutes for June 22nd? It's been moved by Ms. Creason and seconded by Dr. McKibben. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 That was unanimous. With that, we are at our business item, C1, California Voting Rights Act, public hearing number two, potential composition of by trustee areas pursuant to election code section 10010, subdivision A1, and other applicable provisions of the law prior to the drawing of maps and resolution number 3059. Ms. Simlick. Thank you and good evening, President Velasquez, board members, Superintendent Kern and Ms. Cunningham. Tonight, the board will hear from Mr. Justin Rich of Cooperative Strategies, who will provide a present presentation on the process and potential criteria for drawing the trustee area boundary maps. And the board will hold the second pre-map public hearing regarding this process prior to the drawing of maps. Before Mr. Rich, I would like to introduce to the board, Dominic Spinelli, attorney and counsel for the district in the California Voter Rights Act litigation. Mr. Spinelli will provide information regarding the CDRA timeline that will be discussed during the pre presentation. Mr. Spinelli. Good evening, uh, President Velasquez and board members, Superintendent Kern and audience. My name is Dominic Spinelli. I represent you in the litigation filed by several plaintiffs uh, that has been referred to as the California Voting Rights Act litigation. Uh, as a brief update and prelude to Mr. Rich, uh, the litigation is still in, alive and well and moving along. Um, this process that the board started last um, spring 
was stopped by the governor's order uh, due to the pandemic. That order has been rescinded by the governor effective yesterday, which is why the board is restarting that process today. To complete the CVRA process to allow the public to participate in the decision and intention of this board to proceed to trustee area elections. Um, the timeline that Mr. Rich will present is a timeline of essentially 41 days. A timeline can, uh, under the law, is 90 days, which is entitled to be the safe harbor provision. That allows the board to proceed with the process and complete it in a 90 day time frame. And right now, because of the litigation, there is a potential that th that time frame that remains is 80 days or 41 days. We have tried to obtain agreement from the other side at 80 days and have not been able to obtain agreement and therefore we have to proceed and you are proceeding with the 41 day time frame. Um, and that is the time frame that Mr. Rich will be presenting and the board, as my understand, will be following. Um, and that is really about all I have to say uh, on the topic at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spinelli, and I'd like to introduce to the board Justin Rich from Cooperative Strategies. Good evening. Thank you for having me here tonight. I'm Justin Rich with Cooperative Strategies, as was mentioned. Um, I'm going to walk you all through a brief presentation to just share a little bit about uh, the process, our involvement in that. Um, I will touch on the timeline. Uh, as well, but uh, really to outline a little bit more about how the map drawing process goes and of course why we're here tonight is to gather public input and so uh, taking that information and incorporating it into the map scenarios that we'll be presenting to you uh, at, a, at a future date. Um, to cue the presentation. Oh, thank you. There we are. So just to, to start with, I want to describe the really three different election methods uh, that are out there just for, for review. Um, there is the, the district's current method of election, which is at-large elections. Um, this refers to the arrangement where every voter in the district votes for every board member in the district, regardless of geography. Um, the from trustee area elections is another election method uh, which requires trustees to be to reside in a particular area. Uh, yet again, every voter in the district votes for, uh, for, for those trustees. And then the final one which the district has elected to transition to is by trustee area election. So not only do uh, board members need to reside within that particular area, only those voters that also reside within that area are able to vote for, for those uh, candidates. And just as a side note, this is the only election method that has safe harbor under the CVRA. Oh, Just a quick uh, extra background on the CVRA. Um, the CVRA took effect in January 1st, 2003. Um, and what it was intended to do, among a number of, uh, number of other things, is to uh, require that any election method, um, that it does not dilute the, the influence of minority voters. So um, one of the things that's most pertinent to what we're doing here is, is to address that. Um, and at-large elections have been a election method that, um, that are pointed to that can do that. And so uh, the, the purpose of the CVRA was not necessarily to encourage um, elections by trustee area, but, uh, but acknowledge that that is one, um, that is one method that will, um, will help to, to preserve that. Um, just as a reminder that the, the uh, voting areas that are uh, put into place will be applicable for the November 2022 election. Um, and we talked a little bit about the timeline, but I'll dive more into that. 
So as, as required by law, we are holding uh, two public hearings to solicit input and, and feedback from the community and from you all um, about the types of things that should be taken into account. These are, we refer to them as pre-MAP hearings. Um, following tonight's hearing and um, when we get some more feedback, we take the criteria resolution that uh, you all will have before you later uh, we're going to begin our process of drawing maps, um, making sure those maps are in alignment not only with federal and state law, but then also uh, with the criteria that you have selected. Um, and we will bring those back to you. Uh, again, the condensed timeline was, was discussed. We'll be bringing those back to you on July 13th for, again, another round of input and feedback uh, with the goal of... of um, of adopting those trusty areas and the map on July 27th. Um, a wrinkle due to COVID, much like many other things in, in life right now, um, normally this would have been done in conjunction with the new census data, uh, but given the timeline that you're under, uh, the way this process will work is to, uh, to adopt boundaries based on the 2010 census data and then once the 2020 census data is released, we will come back and make adjustments as necessary to finalize those boundaries for the 2022 election. So this will be discussed a little bit more in depth um, in the resolution that you will be considering tonight. And we also have some further slides just to, to provide some more information um, but the considerations or, or the criteria that are used in uh, drawing trustee areas, um, to start with each area, and this is in, in accordance with, with federal law, uh, each area shall uh, contain roughly the same number uh, or the same population. Um, that's interpreted to, to mean um, plus or minus 5% uh, between the largest and the smallest so that the combined difference between those areas are, is no greater than 10%. Um, these will also be drawn uh, to comply with the Federal Voting Rights Act, in particular Section 2. Um, they will be as compact and contiguous as possible. Um, obviously, that can be challenging when you have geographic and topographical features, but um, that's, that's also an important consideration. They'll respect communities of interest, uh, those groups that have shared social or, or economic uh, characteristics. Uh, they will follow, like I mentioned, man-made and, and natural geographic features. Um, to the extent possible, it will respect incumbency, um, and then other local considerations as well. As I mentioned, the resolution that you have before you tonight and you will be considering um, will provide your direction to us on the criteria that we will use while we're drawing up the maps. Um, of note, complying with the requirements, uh, the equal population requirements of the federal and also the Federal Voting Rights Act. Um, it outlines a number of other criteria that can be considered, some of which I just shared with you. Um, and also just the fact that for each one of the scenarios that we present, there will be uh, certain criteria may be weighted one over the other. And I think that's our job in this is to be able to show you when you uh, emphasize one criteria versus another, what does a map look like that complies with that or, or, or meets those considerations. So I'm going to run through these criteria with you and just summarize them. Um, again, these are outlined in detail in the resolution. Um, number one is the, the equal population. Uh, we keep uh, going back to that, but that's really one of the most fundamental um, criteria here. Also making sure that in, in number two, um, that the areas are not gerrymandered in a way that uh, dilutes the, the influence of uh, protected classes. Uh, number three, um, to, to make sure that, again, section two of the Federal Voting Rights Act to um, avoid the dilution of, 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 of minority influence. 
Number four, uh, that the, the boundaries will be as compact as is practicable. Um, and that the boundaries, number five, are also contiguous uh, to the extent practicable. Uh, the, the boundaries of the trustee areas shall also uh, take into account communities of interest. Um, these are some of the things that when we're looking at maps and we're looking at, um, you know, streets and roads and other things like that, um, the local knowledge and input about communities of interest can really be, uh, you know, is very valuable to us on the, on the demographic side as we're drawing them. Number seven, um, taking into account the high school attendance boundaries um, and, and looking to uh, draw boundaries that uh, consider or, or respect those. Uh, number eight, the visible features, again, topography, geography, and things like that, that may delineate various communities or neighborhoods. Um, a, in, in number nine, keeping in mind that the growth the, the district has seen over the last 10 years um, to account for changes that may be needed, may be needed in the future, um, considering ways to, uh, to allow for that growth, either by uh, keeping some areas a little bit smaller so that when the 2020 data comes out that there's um, likely to be more equal population distribution, those are things we'll take into consideration um, and then the number 10 related to incumbency, trying to avoid uh, situations where there's multiple trustees in a single area. And then finally, number 11, other criteria that you all think uh, are, are important and that we should be taking into account as we prepare our maps and our scenarios. So quickly, I would like to just share with you the, uh, the 2010 census data and how, um, how that uh, plays out for, for your district. Um, again, this is now um, you know, over 10 years old, so uh, we expect that there will be changes um, and we um, should have had that data towards the, the beginning of the year and uh, has consistently been delayed. So we, we look to get that information in late August or September, I think is the, the most up-to-date timing. Um, what you'll see here is the not only the total population uh, of the district's voters, but we've also listed those that are age 18 and over and, and presumably um, you know, able to vote. Um, it breaks this down by uh, the very ethnic, various ethnic categories, um, and those are uh, those are in the table for your reference. There's also a map on the left-hand side that shows the um, the city boundaries within the district and some of the major roads that are laid out there as well. One thing that is available at this time is the 2020 population estimate from the census. Uh, what we're waiting for is um, we're waiting for um, finer detail at the census block uh, level so that we can do our analysis. Um, and we were able to get this information from a, from a third party provider uh, that shows what they believe the um, the change in population is over the uh, the last 10 years. So comparing 2010 to an estimate of what 2020 would be. Uh, we've taken that into our, into our mapping system and compared the, the population changes and the map reflects um, those areas, those census blocks that have grown or uh, declined during that period of time. Uh, the darker blue, almost black color represents those areas that have grown uh, the most. And those areas that are kind of a dark red or maroon color are those areas that have declined. You'll see that it's really spread out over the district and um, there's um, growth and decline all, all over there. Um, all told, the, the estimated population change is about 10,500, which is about 3% of uh, the district's total population. We also have the citizen voting age population uh, that's provided by the American Community Survey. Uh, we've plotted that here. Um, 
and this breaks down um, what, what we've done is we've layered on the largest uh, ethnic group other than, than white is the Hispanic Latino group. Um, and it shows the concentration of uh, residents within the district that are uh, part of the citizen voting age population, those that would be eligible to, to vote um, in, in elections. Um, again, you'll see that in the beige, uh, or excuse me, in the dark brown colors uh, are the areas that, are, that have higher concentrations of Hispanic Latino uh, voting age residents and those that are white or uh, tend to be a little bit more of, of, the, brown, of the light brown color uh, where there's less concentration. So this brings us to the question of how should the lines be drawn? So I'd like to talk to you uh, or talk you through some of the different considerations and some of the ways that um, we can take your input and feedback and then translate that into the maps and the scenarios that we create. Um, an example of, of the type of, of feedback uh, would be talking about certain neighborhoods or, or certain communities that, um, you know, based on uh, those connections between those communities uh, should be kept together uh, and it makes sense for them to be in the same trustee area. Um, beyond that, um, What's helpful for us is, is more, specific, more specific information. Uh, again, when we're just looking at a map or we're looking at the, the topographic features of, of a district, we may not get the same sense of the various communities, those communities of interest within the district. So for us, it's helpful to get uh, specific directions about you know, the, the various dividing lines, streets or uh, you know, freeways, roadways, and things like that. Um, with the primary rationale being that it helps keep communities together because we're, we're trying to avoid splitting various communities and that it provides good representation to those within the community. Another example um, might be that each elementary school boundary should be either within the same trustee area or it should be split. Some of the feedback that we hear is that um, when you go from voting at large to voting by trustee area, there's a concern that there will be uh, favoritism played and that certain uh, schools may get more support from various board members. So if, if you decide to put those into multiple areas, perhaps that, um, you know, we'll, we'll deal with that. But I think those are uh, very school district specific and, and your individual circumstances would, um, would help guide us. Um, again, I think that just going back to the rationale, our hope is, is that um, when we apply those criteria, at the end of the day, it helps keep communities together and it provides better, rep better representation. Uh, just to quickly touch on the next step. So after tonight and conducting the second public hearing on, on the, um, on the pre-maps, um, we, the, the draft, um, criteria resolution is before you. Once you adopt that resolution and, and any associated changes, we'll take that and begin our map making process, um, Again, we, we ran through all of those, those multiple criteria to come back to you with various scenarios that you can start to review and parse and, and see what you do like or that you don't like about uh, those, those scenarios that we've created. Uh, so that's really the next step. Um, and then after that point, we're the, the current schedule shows holding two public hearings on those uh, draft scenarios. Um, with the goal of um, adopting the map at the July 27th uh, board meeting. Questions for you all. Thank you for the presentation. We're going to do one round of questions here with my colleagues, then we will um, hear all public comment, and then if necessary, we'll return back to um, the dais. Thank you for the presentation. I'll You're turn welcome. it to my colleagues for any questions. Mr. Hernandez. Thank you. Um, I don't have a question. I have a comment. Is that okay? Okay. Well, I'll go first then. First of all, welcome everybody. Appreciate you being here. Um, 
I would like to make a comment and then I will share some information that I have work, been working on for a while. It is my hope as we begin this process to either move to seven or stay at five, that we do so by focusing on all the important factors within our school district. I am not proposing that we move to seven or stay at five at this moment. We have often heard from some that a district of our, our size should have seven board members as six of the largest school districts in California have seven board members. This is based on the 10 largest school districts in the state, according to the California Department of Ed, based on student population. I began to compare our district with these six districts to see if I could find a size correlation that exists between seven versus five and not based on student population. So please look at my very non-scientific chart. It is correct that six of the largest school districts in California have seven board members. We are number 10, according to the Department of Ed. Again, this figure is based on student population using 2019 to 2020 numbers. And this is how I process this information. Maybe districts that have seven members could be because of the sheer land size or mass of that district. Example, LA Unified has 720 square miles within their district boundaries, 103 square miles per board member. We have 77 total as a district, so 15 square miles per board member. So let's look at one in our county in the top 10, which is Elk Grove Unified, which also has seven board members. They are five times bigger than us. Each board member in Elk Grove represents 47 square miles compared to our 15 per board member. Only Fresno Unified has a smaller landmass than us in the top 10 schools in the state. I then focused on the seven board members. I'm sorry, I then focused on having said board, seven board members if it helps you be more efficient as a district. With the help of our former CFO, Mr. Stevens, we got some financial history of all the 10 districts on the list. There are many factors to determine how well a district is run, but usually the manner in which a district handles their finances or budget is a good indicator. Without a healthy budget, you lose programs and teachers. We have another school district in our county, not in the top 10, but very similar to us. They're having major financial and district problems. They also have seven board members. So using this list, two of the six largest school districts with seven board members have had a positive certification of the last three years. Compare that to the four districts that have five board members in the top 10 districts Three of the four have had a positive certification over the last three years. I share this information for you trying to make a point that as we discuss to move to seven or stay at five, that we stay focused on the important factors within our district. To state that we should be at seven or five because of other districts, for whatever reason, is not in the best interest of our district, in my opinion. Again, I am not proposing that we move to seven or stay at five. I look forward from hearing all the parties involved to help us make a decision. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hernandez. Ms. Costa. Mr. Hernandez, that's amazing, great research. I'm very impressed. And it's information that actually CSBA couldn't get for us. So isn't it interesting that one of our own board members got it? So thank you. Um, also welcome to everybody. I'm really grateful that we're back in person for board meetings and that the governor's order has been rescinded. It means that we're moving back to life as it was pre-COVID, which is, has been our intention since we started the process and um, our intention for our students to be back in person in the fall. I really have appreciated all of the communication and feedback from many community members who've called me and emailed me. Uh, I agree with the criteria in resolution 3059. I have one addition and that addition would be that each trustee district should have a minimum of one high school or more. Um, I would really like to encourage the public who is listening to this broadcast on YouTube and the public that's in the audience to come on either Wednesday the 14th 
It's July 14th from 6.30 to 8 at either Dyer Kelly, Casa Roble, or Mira Loma, or on Thursday, July 15th at Greer, Mesa Verde, or the district office. Your feedback is important. We want to hear from as many of you as possible. Either send in your comments if you're watching on YouTube or in person and come to the community forums. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Costa. Ms. Creason. Thank you for the presentation. I have a couple questions. I want to be sure that you get what you need from us in community tonight. So what exactly do you need to walk away with? I think looking at the criteria resolution and affirming that those are all things that uh, are important to the board. Uh, in addition, you know, looking at high school attendance boundaries uh, or, or high schools, um, those types of things are, are certainly helpful for us. Um, and then perhaps after the public hearing and there's other um, folks from the community that have good ideas as you discuss those and think, yeah, you know what, that's, that's something we should really account for. We hadn't thought of that. That's the kind of input that's really helpful for our firm in drawing maps that really reflect what you want. Got it. Thank you. That's really helpful. I know yeah. the one thing I do want to hear public comment before I go too far into this, but the one thing that really stood out that really unsettles me is the protection of incumbency. I don't, it's my vote. I would vote on that right now that we shouldn't do that. That shouldn't be a criteria at all. Um, but I would love to get through the process and I might have more things to share after that, but that's one that really um, strikes, stands out. Um, and then question about census. I, I do find it really unfortunate that census didn't come out when it was supposed to come out. Um, that really unsettles me knowing and understanding the change, the great change that has happened in our community over the last 10 years. That said, um, if it's going to come out this year, does that mean that we're going to be going through this process again before the 2022 election? Yeah, unfortunately, you will be. I do think that it will be a much more fluid process. We will, again, we'll have criteria, input, and feedback to be able to go through that quicker. We have a starting point in terms of, of the map that uh, you'll be you know, adopting a few weeks from now. Um, and you know, I think there's then we're just making adjustments and hopefully they're small adjustments. Um, and I think that's, that's what we would be looking to do. Okay, and then does that change require the same process we're going through now with the five hearing? That doesn't happen? No. Okay, understood. Um, I think that's enough for me for now. Thank you. Sure. If I could just make a point of process real quick before I call on you, Dr. McKibben, and that's just, um, I want my colleagues to know, and I know staff's taking notes as well, but also in the event it's helpful for the public. So in the board packet, you'll see the resolution and the criteria. And so we'll be doing a little bit of active development here. Yeah. Um, and I'm taking notes. Like we had a very specific kind of note already about each district should have one high school or more and a specific call out on the lack of a preference for one of the identified criteria, et cetera. So just like, that's the activity for the evening. Yes, Ms. Creason. Sure. And we're gonna come back as well, but yes. I'm sorry, Dr. McKibben. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I did it um, acknowledge, I think Pam's idea, or, sorry, Ms. Costa's idea for making sure everyone has a high school also is very, very reasonable. And then I just want to talk about, ask a quick process question. It's my understanding that once maps are actually ready and those go out to community, that those can be tweaked along the way. So it's not like, okay, we're going to make a decision. These are the static, you know, maps. They're not static. They can be changed before it comes to us to vote at this last, the fifth meeting. Is that correct? That's right. Okay. Yes. Thank you. No, I'm really done. Can, can I build off because it, it goes in line with <clears throat> Ms. Creason's questions. I was watching a, a board meeting, actually Elk Grove the other day, and they were talking about the growth in their district. And it's probably more significant than we've seen, but they were going to try and draw some of the maps. And you said that you have some of that data already. Um, is that a consideration that knowing that there's those changes, you could try and do that? And would you identify maybe one map that took that into consideration and one that didn't? How does that work? I, I don't know. Yeah, that's, those are great questions. And I think we would do that. I think we, again, when we come back to you, there's going to be multiple scenarios. Those scenarios may favor one of these criteria over another. But to your point, I think that we can come back with one that 
leaves a little bit more room. We have to be within that 10% threshold, but perhaps in those areas where we know there's growth that has happened, um, we keep those a little bit smaller in terms of uh, total population, knowing that when we get 2020 census data, we will likely see more residents in those areas. Therefore, when we redo the maps, there will be less uh, adjustments that need to be made. Um, of course, while we may know total population, um, you know, at, at this time, and we can sort of look forward, we still have to go back and look at the, uh, you know, the ethnic composition and how that's affected. So, um, but certainly that's something we'll keep in mind. Dr. McKibben, I both want to thank you for your patience and have you go next. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to uh, go back to uh, slide six and ask you a couple of questions. For example, on uh, the criteria uh, two on that page, it talks about the um, uh, principles uh, established uh, related to gerrymandering in the Shaw decision. Do you, uh, can you give me a summary of of what kinds of things should we be looking out for related to that criteria in terms of gerrymandering? Are we talking about the classic slivers or, 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 or what, uh, what did Shaw say basically? Yeah, I'm stepping a little bit out of my expertise because I'm not your attorney, but in those cases, and, and I think what we're trying to avoid is those situations where uh, in, in accordance with, with section two of the federal, vote, federal Voting Rights Act, um, that we're not cracking certain populations or communities of interest in order to dilute their ability to vote, or we're not um, packing them all. So those are sort of the, the two standard um, you know, terms that, that refer to this, putting them all into one district so as to um, allow uh, or again, to, to limit their ability to influence the outcome of an election. Okay, thank you. Yeah. In terms on that same page, you talk about the examples of interest and in groups like that. Um, does this only relate to protected classes related to ethnicity, race, and, and language? Let me give you an example of that, and I don't think it's exactly the right definition, but we have about 13% of our students in this district that uh, have uh, IEPs, Individualized uh, Educational Plans. Sure. Those would seem to me logically to be a community of interest and, and we ought to be looking to make sure uh, that we don't disadvantage those folks. It appears in this, they are not a consideration uh, uh, or am I incorrect in that? I can give you the definition from, from the state constitution. Uh, again, stepping a little bit outside of my expertise, uh, not being your attorney, but uh, what it refers to is a contiguous population with shared social and, econo and economic interests. So I'm not sure that that would, would meet that uh, definition. Um, but again, that's my layman's um, view of it. Okay, because those are, uh, in as a percentage of things that are larger than all, uh, all of those things that are on our maps, but one. And, and it would uh, seem as a board, those ought to be something that we ought to think about and so forth. But if they're not part of this process, then they're not part of this process. Yeah, not sure if I would defer to you on that or? Yeah. Uh, the, my my last one has to do with uh, 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 picking up on on Miss Costas thing. One of the things that I think that is the high school thing is absolutely correct. I think that perhaps even middle schools would would fit into that. But even going further than that, we have uh, various feeder systems within the district, and I think those ought to be at least considered, if not uh, uh, part, of the, uh, part of the criteria. And are, are you referring to the attendance boundaries yes. of the elementary? Yeah, certainly. And, and we have that data so that we are able to plot that and show you what that looks like in these scenarios um, and how those would be impacted. So 
um, certainly we can in, you know, incorporate that into our analysis and into our maps. And, and finally, one, one, I'm sorry, I cheated no. one more. Uh, in terms of as we look at maps and so forth and know that uh, if we go to seven, we're gonna have approximately 46, and if we stay at five, we're gonna be approximately 64,000 and so forth. Is there any way to have maps that, uh, uh, of particularly uh, of eight, uh, 18 plus voters that show approximately how many uh, people are in a particular grid section or something like that, or is that too difficult to do? Just so I'm clear, so to show you a map that has the census blocks and the population that is within those census blocks? Yes. Certainly we could provide one of those uh, and, and do that. At, you know, at this time that would be based on the 2010 census or the uh, third party data provider that, you know, that I shared with you earlier. So, but yes, we, I mean, we can provide that. Because I was looking at some of the earlier maps and it seemed like there was, a, looked like there was a chunk added to a map. And I was wondering well, why that was, was, was it indeed because that had a family that had 20 kids or something. Oh, I see. Yeah. So you, you mean in, in terms of the map that showed the population change? Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, I, we can we can show you that or we can show you the growth. But, but generally, they also the, the overall notion of, of where people are. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McKibben. And thank you as well for, for the presentation. So I just want to kind of clarify a few things. There's been a couple of maps, different maps floating around, often with comments suggesting that, you know, we've we voted them down or haven't considered them or have no intention to adopt a particular map um, that has been drafted. Can you just clarify for me at this point in the process that there have been no maps for this process that we started in March of 2020? We have not done any maps at this time. We're waiting for a criteria resolution from you all that will really set the table for us to do our analysis. Um, so no, there have been no maps created at this time. Thank you for clarifying. Yep. Um, there's also a, a bit of a, a narrative that the board refuses to transition to, to seven seats. And this doesn't accompany a question. This is more just me making a comment. Um, at this point, we have not ruled out anything at all where we are at in a process. We're at the front end of a process um, and we are at this time, establishing our criteria for developing trustee boundaries. We have noted and clarified at various points that the intention is to consider a set of maps that includes five trustee areas and a set that includes maps with seven trustee areas. Can you confirm that that is also your understanding of the discussions that have taken place to date? That is my understanding, yes. Thank you. This is not off the table and any narrative that we have refused to consider a certain map or certain seat numbers is likely intended to sow divisiveness and conflict. I'll also comment on, uh, and this I wanna, I, I'm kind of in a, um, alignment with what Mr. Hernandez said here, which is just this seven seats are automatically better. I appreciate the research that you brought to the group for consideration. Thank you very much. I also, it's slightly less official than your um, research, but I did re reach out to um, a couple of scholars and emerging scholars in the field just around, you know, governance and student outcomes and what, can, what do we already know about governance teams and how they impact student outcomes. And emerging evidence demonstrates that school boards may have an influence on student achievements which is not that surprising. And unsurprisingly, high quality governance tended to have greater student achievement. And while there is not currently specific research on the side of size of boards impacting student outcomes, we can infer from the research on board quality and responsibilities that larger boards are likely to face more difficulties creating policy coherence and strong governance outcomes. So again, fair, we're at the beginning of a process uh, my interest is hearing community input that is part of this process. Um, and I thank everyone who's who's been a part of it thus far. Um, I do have a couple of items that I want to add kind of for consideration. Um, I've said this in prior public settings, but I'll say it again. Um, while it's legally permissible, as you've noted in the criteria and the trustee areas, um, where incumbents currently live is not a priority for me for consideration. 
Um, and I don't think it's necessary as a formal consideration for map adoption. I care more about seats that represent our communities. Um, I want to echo support for um, the criteria, criteria addition from Ms. Costa around the one high school um, or more per seat. <laughs> um, and also just want to clarify, you know, there's, there's a list of things we can offer to you for consideration while we're considering the maps. And then there's kind of our formal criteria list. And so I think this was along the lines of what Dr. McKibben was suggesting as well. But um, throughout the consideration of the maps, I would also like to see information related to both the high schools and the middle schools and the elementary schools that generally um, matriculate to, to those schools because I think it'll be helpful information to consider. I'm not sure if that needs to be specifically called out in our criteria. We can have a little bit more discussion about that in a bit, but I just wanted to um, kind of echo that, that sentiment. Um, and then I just wanted to add a little bit of um, material that may be helpful when considering some of the maps. And, um, you know, in 2018, I think mo most folks probably are familiar, but um, the SACB noted that the Arden Arcade is the place with the most income inequality in the entire state. And this is according to the US Census Bureau tracks, um, which measures income inequality using the Gini index. And granted, it is slightly outdated. There was a 2018 SACB article that was using 2016 data. Um, that being said, given recent events and everything that has transpired since 2016, I can't imagine it's improved or at least not improved in any dramatic way. Um, and I just want to note that in 2010, particularly since we'll be at least preliminarily using 2010 census data, there was an incorporation effort that I was briefly a part of at that time, and it very closely looked at the demographics of kind of the Arden Arcade boundaries. Um, and at that time, there was two maps that were part of that process. Um, one included boundaries that went all the way south to the river, so all the way down. Um, and then one included um, a map where the southern boundary um, stopped at Fair Oaks. So it would have carved out, most folks who are part of the community know it would have carved out uh, a lot of the lots and parcels of Fair Oaks that don't necessarily match the demographics of everything north of that area. So I just offer that in case that background is helpful when considering, because um, that demographic is very, very, very different. And I know we're talking in pretty broad generalities but it should be taken into consideration that those communities are not the same. Um, and to the extent that we are considering like neighborhoods and communities, that might be information to consider. I'd be happy to kind of send the old links, the LAFCO analysis that went with that, et cetera. Um, and then can you just articulate one more time, we've done it a couple of times, but the process after the census, just to make it absolutely clear that like there will be a smaller version, but a 2.0 version of this process. Yeah, and so again, our um, best estimate at this time is that we will have the block level census data that we need in order to do this uh, in late August or early September. Um, I think at this time, um, what we've discussed with your attorneys and, and has, has been discussed internally is uh, at least one public hearing at that time. Um, but I think more likely needs to be known about how drastic are those changes and does, you know, does it require more of that? And uh, I think as this, pro this, you know, first step in the process concludes and uh, you transition with a map that you've approved, once that wraps up, we'll have a better sense of, okay, you know, this, at, at that time, I think we can look forward and say that maybe we do need more public hearings or actually, you know, we, we address most of the major issues. I, you know, it's hard, hard to know sitting from here, but, um, and the intention is to wrap that up in December of 2021, January of 2022. You have to have those new attendance, those, excuse me, voting areas in place by the end of February so that we can have that um, those in place for the November 2022 election. Does that make sense? I went through a lot of dates, but um, yeah, that's that's the timeline at this point. It does make sense. And I just appreciate the clarification. It's just, yeah. again, um, it's, it's a process. Government 
isn't always the fastest <laughs> moving train. Well, and um, the, the reason for that, just to add on one thing, is that the reason why it needs to be done so far in advance is in order to give the county registrar time yes, to be mm -hmm. able to implement the election. Um, so that's a major reason why. It's not just your district that's affected. There's county agencies as well. I actually do have one more question. So on slide six and seven, there were some enumerated trustee area or trustee considerations, mm -hmm. um, or rather criteria to, to take into consideration. Can you just give a little bit of background on where that comes from? Does that come from statute? Does that come from prior um, prior cases and prior efforts? Just some, broadly, can you? Yeah, share? no, certainly. Thank you. And so it it comes from not only federal law but state law, uh, and then some of the others, I think, are also um, you know, best practices that districts throughout the state have, have been doing. Um, but, but specifically, um, you know, when it comes to the equal population, that's a federal requirement. Um, you know, gerrymandering, that's a federal court decision that was made um, and, and requires us to, uh, to be in compliance with. Um, you know, the, again, cr criteria number three related to, um, to the section two of the Federal Voting Rights Act, not diluting minority uh, influence. Um, so, um, and then as far as compact and contiguous, I think those are things that are contained within the state voting rights uh, act, but uh, also really, um, apply to, you know, that's also covered by gerrymandering, right? And compact and contiguous doesn't lead to those strange uh, boundary lines that, you know, that we were talking about earlier. So uh, some of these cross over as well. And, uh, you know, there are, um, there are ad advocacy groups and organizations that have put, um, you know, have spent a lot of time researching this and how, um, you know, protected classes have um, had their their voting influ influence, um, uh, you know, diluted and and impacted. And these are some of the best practices that come from um, from them. So, and I think some of these aren't just applicable to school districts. It's it's applicable to all local agencies here in California and nationally. Great. I just appreciate the background on kind of where we got to sort of our starting place for consideration. That's super helpful. When you're done. I am, am done and we're about to move to, to the public comment section. So I was just going to ask you one quick question around following up on her question about gerrymandering. We, we often see that if, if a board would say we're not going to protect the incumbency, that makes it much easier to really draw boundaries related to, you know, all of the other classifications or identifications. Would that be the case? Because even, even some maps I've seen from years ago of which none of these board members were on at the time, you see very edges of, of individuals and times like that. So in, in your experience, how does that work? I think that's that's probably the case, although I do think there's other situations where you may not have very compact and contiguous uh, areas because you're trying to create opportunity districts or majority minority districts. And that is a requirement of the Federal Voting Rights Act. And um, so that I think is important to note that during this process and what was talked about in the presentation, sometimes these criteria are in conflict. Um, and so it's important for us to be able to show you what the possibilities are. Um, and then you can prioritize certain criteria over others. So um, I do think that's right though. I, I, I do think when you're not thinking about incumbency, um, you know, that probably frees you up to focus more on the other criteria. And that's how I'd look at it. Just what, one thing that I would want to clarify, um, when I heard you talk about uh, not only high schools and where they're located and also boundaries, for our benefit, it's helpful to know if you mean having uh, the physical location of the high schools within there or if you're looking to have multiple boundaries. So just keeping that in mind when the criteria resolution uh, is, is adopted, if that makes sense. That does make sense. I'm actually just going to put a pause on a question here because I think that should be up for discussion. I had one interpretation of it, but it might not be a shared one. So if I can just make a note really quickly. And hopefully I can both read and remember my note. Um, we do have a couple of requests to, to circle back. Uh, Mr. Hernandez. 
you know, I, I love everything I'm hearing so far. I do uh, love the, the middle school feeder program, but I think we have a conflict in some times. For example, um, Will, Rod Will Rogers is across the street from Del Campo, but it feeds into San Juan in a whole other city of Citrus Heights. So I think that we would have to take a look at that, that I think the intent is good, but we may have to uh, understand that that may not be the case in all aspects. I think we even have some non boundary schools in our district. So that's unique. Um, and so I think that that's a great example that you just bring up. And I just to put a finer point on that, I think that then you have those situations where what takes precedence, communities of interest uh, or school boundaries. And, you know, arguably that's, that's a community of interest within the school district, um, but perhaps not in, in terms of the definition of, uh, you know, the state constitution. So. It looks like we're going to do one more round. I wanted to see, Ms. Costa, do you have anything to add at this time? Okay, Ms. Creason. And just to kind of piggyback off to, after what Mr. Hernandez said, another layer that kind of convolutes things is we are an open enrollment district. So a lot of the kids that are in the district are in, you know, the boundary don't necessarily go to school in the boundary. So that's something, I mean, I know that's not gonna be solved by this process, but that's something that this board really needs to think about, the challenges that come as from an alternate open enrollment district. Doing one last check for any, for this round. Okay, just a reminder, we will, we will circle back. Um, with that, um, I declare the topic of the California Voting Rights Act potential composition of by trustee areas pursuant to elections code section 10010, subdivision A1, and other applicable provisions of the law prior to the drawing of maps, a public hearing, and it is now open for public comment. I'm gonna go ahead and strike the gavel to make it official. Um, we do have public comments at this time, and I'd like to remind the public that comments are limited to two minutes and the clock on the wall will count down the time. Um, as noted at the outset of the meeting, we will begin with individuals who are here um, with us today to offer public comment. And then at the end, we will read those that have been submitted as well. I'm gonna read out um, names based on the order by which folks were signed up. Um, I'll just say in advance, it's based off of our interpretation of a handwritten card. So I apologize in advance if I um, mispronounce your name, but I'm gonna do my best. I will announce the individual who should come up and then who is next or on deck. So we're gonna start with Tina Gonzalez Casanova and then on deck is Victoria Castanzo, that might be Castaneda. Um, Tina, please begin your two minutes when you are ready. Good evening, everybody. My name is Tina Gonzalez Casanova, and I am a community member. I've lived in um, my house down the street for 35 years. I've taught in San Juan for 40. We purchased our home on purpose to live within the district that I work with. I worked in for all the hard work I wanted to go towards my children. Um, to benefit that. I want to start out by saying that the um, students in San Juan deserve a board that balances the needs of all the students in the North, the East, the South, and even in the West End. Each board member, as you guys have done in the past, needs to know all of the aspects that's going on within the community uh, in our district. Five people um, seems to be a reasonable amount and has proven in the 40 years that I've taught in San Juan um, to make decisions that are good for kids. The existing five-person model demonstrates for students how people make decisions together, holding all the individuals important and precious. I would like to... I personally believe that we need to keep the five-person model so that the decisions can continue to be made that are... Uh, for the most needy and the most urgent decisions. By having way too many people in that, uh, too many cooks in the kitchen, I believe that will muddy up the waters. It's been working and I'd like us to stay a for a five person model. Thank you. Thank you. And we're gonna take a short pause while we uh, get our timer up. I did have it on my phone, but you probably couldn't read it, but you were well within the two minutes. Thank you for your remarks. Something's counting down.
Well, I'm happy to also do it on my phone. My concern is that people might not be able to see the time. Um, so I'm trying to find a better way to display it on my phone, but I appreciate that. Can you see this? <laughs> I'm so sorry. You know what, um, what I'll do is I will raise my hand when there's 30 seconds. I'm good. Let's go. Thank Let's you. Do it. Let's go. I Let's like that it. attitude. Let's get started. We're trying to problem solve on the fly. We've got Don't Victoria worry. Castando followed by Ben Avey. Well, please for clarification, thank you. Uh, my name is Victoria Castaneda. <laughs> good evening. Um, I'm a small business owner in Art and Arcade, former educator. I have been a homeowner and taxpayer in the district for 30 years. My two children are graduates of the district. I was one of the leaders to get a multi-purpose room built at Dale Dale School, elementary school, long, long time ago. I have served as a vice president of the PTSA at Rio Americano and president of PTSA at El Camino. I have volunteered countless hours in the classroom. I strongly recommend that you implement seven electoral districts in San Juan. The underserved and marginalized communities of West Arden Arcade and Citrus Heights need their own representatives on the school board. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Castaneda. We will now go to Ben Avey, followed by Marty Velasco. Mr. Avey. Good evening, President, uh, board members, superintendents. Good to see you all in person. Apologize I couldn't make it last week, but my colleague Katie Reed was here representing the San Juan Parents Association. I come to you tonight to share our support for by district elections. I think we've shared that before. We are an organization that believes in representation and the ability for parents to fight for their students and put kids first. By district elections helps us do that. Representation is a key aspect of that. Representation can only come from the individual relationship that you have with that board member from your local community. Absent that, you are not gonna get the representation that you deserve. We have been fighting for our kids for 12 to 18 months, and I can tell you we have not had as much engagement with the board as we would like. And I think that comes down to representation and the board's ability to interact and communicate with individual families and individual communities. The more representatives you have, the easier it is for them to engage. And that's what elections are about. It is not a performance review. It is about representation and a person's ability to communicate and work with their elected official. Now, I appreciate Mr. Han Hernandez's research. I too did my own research and I have a color-coded chart. I took a little bit of a broader look. I looked at the top 25 largest districts by enrollment. Sacramento County has four. Of those four, San Juan is the only one that only has five trustees, the other have seven. When I took a broader look at the large districts in Northern California, there were 10. Again, San Juan is the only one with five trustees. Oakland, San Francisco, Stockton, Clovis. Across the district, across Northern California, seven districts. Why? It makes sense to represent the people you're elected to serve. We urge your support for bi-district elections. We appreciate how expeditiously you're moving with them. We do appreciate that, the quicker the better. And we appreciate you moving to five or to seven trustee districts. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Avey. Next, we have Marty Velasco, followed by Juan Iniguez. Good evening. Um, I, my name is Marty Velasco. Thank you for having me here tonight. Um, I'd like to speak to you about the move to the by trustee area elections and whether the district should be a five or seven member board. I'm a school counselor in the district. Uh, my children both attended San Juan Unified Schools. I live within the district. So this decision will affect me in, on many levels. That's why I encourage you to maintain a five member board. 
We have many large districts in California who are run successfully with five member boards and San Juan happens to be one of them. Uh, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Uh, over the last few months, I have been increasingly concerned with some of the rhetoric um, regarding moving to a seven member board. It seems to be largely led by politicians who ran for school board in the past and lost. And now they're trying to gerrymander our school district for their political ambition. There are several examples of seven member boards throughout the state and our own county facing financial hardships because their boards cannot work together and fight amongst themselves to represent their own sites. We don't have to look very far. Sac City has seven member boards and they are in financial crisis. We are not. Twin Rivers has a seven member board and they have no money to upgrade their schools. Just look around their schools, our, our own schools. We don't have that problem. We currently have the most diverse school board in San Juan Unified School District. Um, in the last few years, the district has been led with an equity lens. That was needed and that has been felt throughout our ranks. I feel it at my school site. I urge you to lead uh, with Thank courage you, Ms. and not allow few people with political self-interest to you, move us in direction and a direction that is not Next good up. for our students. Next Thank up. Thank you. Thank you. We have Juan Iniguez followed by Kathy Morris. Good evening. Um, I had prepared a few remarks, but I think it's more important to respond to a couple of things that have been said. That I think it's more helpful for the dialogue. Mr. Hernandez, thank you for your data. Um, you've been a, a good friend and a uh, respected uh, board member who is always accessible, so I appreciate your input. However, I want to differ with it. By your logic, if we went by population, then Congress would not have its members elected by population. By that same logic, the, same, the, the city of New York, because it's a small, compacted area, uh, would not be able to break down in, into districts. It just doesn't make sense. We're an urban society. We're a dense society. And, and to me, uh, geographic difference doesn't, shouldn't be the indicator. I'm really glad that uh, uh, comment has been on a, made a couple occasions about outcomes. I would recommend indeed that uh, when the maps are drawn, that we take a close look at student outcomes. So why are we insistent uh, for seven board members? Let's take a look at West Arden Arcade and the city of Citrus Heights. Somebody mentioned if it ain't broken, don't fix it. I'm here to tell you it's broken. 15% of middle schools and high school students in Citrus Heights meet or exceed standards in, 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 in math. 15%, that's Citrus Heights. In 2017, uh, we saw the trend in the Sacramento B. Two of our schools in Citrus Heights, San Juan and Sylvan, uh, were declared some of the worst schools in the Sacramento region. That's data, that's outcomes. What about Encina? What about the, the Western Arcade District? In 2018-19, 2 percent of Encina students met or exceeded state standards in science. So yes, let's look at the outcomes. And if you look at them fairly, you will realize five districts do not work. Uh, if everyone's in charge, no one's in charge, it, we need to go to seven districts, two for West Arden Arcade and Citrus Thank Island. you, Mr. Thank Inigas. You. Next up, we have Kathy Morris, followed by Ray Real. Thank you. I am Kathy Morris. I happen to be the president of Citrus Heights District Neighborhoods 7, 8, and 9, which happened to match exactly District 2 for Citrus Heights. We support very strongly seven districts. We believe very much, <clears throat> excuse me, Citrus Heights is a different community. We all have different communities. We need individual representation that can listen to us. I recognize clearly that the board is concerned with the entire uh, school district just like my neighborhood association is concerned with the entire city of Citrus Heights. So we don't look just in one place, but we do believe we need additional representation. And we believe the way we can get it is by the expansion of the board from seven 
from five to seven members so we can get appropriate coverage in Citrus Heights. Thank you. We have Ray Real followed by Amy Kasuni. Thank you, trustees. I'm Ray Reilly. I live in Orangevale. I've watched this process four times in the last couple of years. I sit on the Citrus Heights Water District Board of Directors. I'm not representing the Water District tonight, but I think it's relevant to my comments. I watched Citrus Heights go from at large to by district. It's a very difficult process and I don't envy you the effort that you're going to go through to put this together properly. I was fortunate because the Citrus Heights Water District was by division. So I lived in an area, all three of us lived in different areas and we were elected at large, but we went through the process for CVRA to make it all by district now. So we're individual. I also watched very closely the San Juan Water District development of their by district voting and I think they did a very poor job because they did not pay attention to communities of interest. And they have a district now. If you look at the maps, it looks gerrymandered. To me, it looks like they set it up in a way to protect the interests of the Granite Bay people who are primarily the elect four of their board members are from Granite Bay. I like the idea on the face of it of a seven, seven member board here because I think it'll give you more of an opportunity to reach into your neighborhoods far more effectively. I would like to see you consider that, but not just because I think it's seven is a, the good number here, but because you're looking forward to the next 50 years of management of this district. And the most effective way to do that is to get more engagement in every community and communities of interest and that's gonna be a difficult thing to do, but I would urge you to think long and hard and plan for the future, not just for the five of you, but what are the future boards going to want to see? Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Amy Kasuni followed by Magali Kincaid. Hi, good evening, board members. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. I'm Amy Kasuni, former chair of your parent advisory committee. I also, back in the day, got uh, voted most valuable parent at Early Get for my work on the beautification at that school. And I also spent over 10 years on the art docent program along with lots of volunteer work in the classroom. I'm here tonight to voice, voice my strong support for a seven board member map. The board's parent advisory committee has and continues to be presented with student educational outcome data that is very disturbing. For example, based on the most recently published school accountability report cards, averaging all elementary schools in Citrus Heights, the percentage of elementary students in Citrus Heights meeting or exceeding state standard for English language arts was only 38%, math 30%, and science 24%. This is based on state standardized test. Northwest Arden Arcade, the elementary school data is even more concerning. English language arts, 20% of students, elementary students met state standards and only 16 and nine of elementary students respectively in math and science. This is a hurdle that our district must address for the sake of students, for the futures of our children. It's about lives. Improving educational outcomes is not easy, but it starts with greater connectedness to schools at the site level. A vote for a seven board member map is a vote for greater connectedness to schools for improved student outcomes. It's a vote to support students. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Kasuni. Next up, we have Magali Kincaid followed by Tim Kasuni. Good afternoon, my name is Magali Kincaid and I'm a parent of three children enrolled at San Juan Unified. I've lived in Arden Arcade uh, up and down Fulton and Watt Avenue over the last 20 plus years. And as you consider a decision that will affect many of the students and families throughout this area and other areas across the district, you must prioritize their need to have a voice on the school board. West Arden Arcade needs their own representative. 
Citrus Heights needs their own representative. We need seven trusty areas. It's time to put aside your personal interests and maybe some of those in the audience and bring greater accountability, empowerment into the hands of community and deeper relationships. And you will only do that if you actually engage with the community that's asking you for seven trustees and the others as well, but equally. Thank you. Next up, we have Tim Kasuni, followed by Maria Grialva. Uh, good evening, members of the board. Uh, Tim Kasuni, I'm a business owner here in Sacramento. I have two children, one who is a rising senior in college, another who is a rising junior. Uh, I'm sad to say my daughter is uh, transferred out of the San Juan School District. Uh, my son is in the Ivy League. I was hoping my daughter would follow him at Miralama. We decided not to. Uh, we feel there's a top, excuse me. We feel there's a top down lack of leadership starts at the state level and extends all the way down to this board. I think if you look at the sign behind you, the first word is educate. There's not education. I think all of you should wake up every morning and ask yourselves, are we educating our students? The statistics you've heard tonight should be appalling and force each one of you to look in the mirror. I strongly endorse uh, an expansion to seven members. Um, I'm fearful that there will be a further mass exodus of parents who otherwise would be committed uh, to the San Juan community. It will have a ripple effect on property values and that will only lead to a spiraling, a negative spiraling that has begun decades ago. And I'm hoping that each one of you will reverse that trend and uh, expand this to seven, seven members. Thank you for your time. Next up, we have Maria Grijalva, followed by Earl Lago, Lago Marcino. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Before I uh, read from here, I wanted to uh, tell uh, Mr. Uh, McNichol that this is about this is about representation. It's about really about color. It's not about IEPs. It's about really about colors. And I wanted to tell uh, you that uh, data is skewed. So if you want data that tells you that five is works best, then you can find data that says five works best. It's really the data that you want to find. And so I want to say that there's been a rush to stop the seven seats. Since the end of the shutdown, no jurisdictions has held this district in hearings without Zoom or some way to address the board and public remotely. On June 7th, President Viscalia announced that witnesses had to attend in person. We are all really eager to end odd ways of participating. There really will be no spacing restrictions. And she was kidding. Tonight, there are no sections, no single seats, no space for a speaker with a compromised uh, immune system. So, they received requests to accommodate this disability and they've been ignored. That is my uh, request that I requested a uh, uh, ADA uh, request accommodation, which was ignored. For many of us, the pandemic is not over. Some parents have not taken jobs in the evenings to make up for income lost in the shutdown. Other households have lost a beloved abuela to COVID. So parents can't abandon young children to come here in person. For, for all unable to attend all evening. That's the balance of two minutes. Thank you for joining us. This Thank evening. you. Next up, we have Earl Lago Marcino, followed by Aaron Miner. 
any board members and others, thank you for the opportunity to speak here. I really enjoy your the inspiring words up here, educate, probably the most important one. Um, education is the bastion of our democracy. And our democracy thrives when we have more representation. That's why I support a seven uh, district, seven member board. Um, I think that when a elected official lives in a neighborhood where everybody around them knows that they're representing them specifically, that they're naturally going to, they can't help but think more about the schools that are in their area because their friends and neighbors are going to those schools. Yes, I know that every member of this board is deeply committed to serving every student in this district. But perhaps sometimes it's easier to overlook when you don't have specific representation in an area. So that's why I think that more of representation always better. Um, efficiency is not a sole determinant or a major, shouldn't be a major determinant of whether or not we have democracy. There are much more efficient systems than democracy, but obviously we don't want those. Um, and also causation is not correlation. Just because some districts have five and have problems, I mean, seven and have problems and some five, you know, that's no proof whatsoever. There's more involved in the reasons why they may be having problems with efficiency. I believe this district would be an excellent district in working together with a seven member board and they would all respect each other and work to, towards a common goal of serving all the students equally. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Aaron Miner, followed by Carolina Flores. Good evening. <clears throat> Good evening, trustees, fellow members of the public. I have lived in Citrus Heights for five years, and I have met three colleagues who have attended San Juan High. None of them spoke well of the education there. One of them was not even taught, a recent graduate, was not even taught basic computer literacy. San Juan High has spent its budget on state-of-the-art equipment and medieval education. Their successors will be best served by a seven-member district for the simple reason that every individual's interests are best served when their district is served by more people because there'll be more members per citizen. And any policy that serves a minority of one, by definition, will serve a minority of 4% or 13%. And it is serving the interests of minorities who might be underserved that the spirit in which it is in that spirit that this law has been written and with which this board must comply. Now, I would like to offer two cautions to the board. The first one is in drawing too many comparisons between this district and others. Simply put, we cannot tell whether or not five members or seven members are inherently more efficient unless you control for every single other factor that might differ between them. I have not seen any such indication in the study cited here. The second is this. In all the years in which I have been engaged in public forums such as these, it is my experience that these sorts of meetings are attended by the comfortable. The disaffected do not even know this meeting is taking place. You do not see my colleagues here. Two of them are trying to make a living and have probably not even heard of this meeting. One has left the area and lives in Sacramento now. For most people, if they have a voice at all, it will only be heard at the ballot box. They need seven members. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Carolina Flores, followed by Alejandro Cabrera. Muy buenas tardes. Muchas gracias que me han dado ese tiempo para dar a la audiencia lo, la informe sobre la ley que es Ralph M. Brown Act. Es importante que la comunidad latina esté enterada de cuál es la ley y cómo es la ley que da autoridad al público, no a la agencia gubernamental. Esta vez la directiva ejecutiva de San Juan debe de recibir informes del público, recibir 
recursos que, de, que necesita la comunidad se les pide a la mesa directiva. Esta ley es una manifestación de los derechos y autoridad del público que sobresale en la autoridad de las, todas las agencias del gobierno. El gobierno sirvará a las directivas del público. Así es la ley. La, el gobierno sirvará, servirá las directivas del público. Las juntas de esta mesa ejecutiva de San Juan tienen que ser abiertas a todo el público, completamente abiertas. Tienen que dar uh, esa audiencia para discutir, tiene que te, se permitir esa participación. Si no se participa del público, no se pueden hacer decisiones en esta mesa directiva. Es la ley. No pueden continuar sin la uh, participación del público. Ustedes necesitan que reconocer la ley los pone a ustedes a servir la comunidad. Ustedes tienen que ayudar a los estudiantes. Están fallando los estudiantes de Encina, San Juan. Están dando fondos de recursos a artes. Dieron 2% a Encina. Y Howe recibió 20% de los fondos para arte. Greer recibió 15% de los fondos de artes. Ustedes son los culpables. Ustedes son los que fallan los niños. Ustedes son los que han robado el futuro de los hispanoparlantes, de los mexicanos, de los negros y pakistanis. Por favor, Gracias, hay que corregir Flores. esto. Would you like a translator for your remarks or would you like to read your remarks in English? I'm going to read some of it because oh. some of it pertains to the Ralph Brown Act. We'll restart for the two minutes if that's okay. Thank you. Wait a minute, don't start timing yet. The Brown Act, let's clarify that. The legislator, legislature finds and declares the public commission boards Uh, school boards, all, all those receive input from the public. The public has the authority to tell you, the agency, how they want things to be done, how they want you to serve, and how they want you to spend their tax dollars. This is what the people do. The people of this state do not yield their sovereignty to the agencies which serve them. The people, in delegating the authority, do not give their public servants the right to decide what is good for the people to know and what is not good for them to know. The people insist on remaining informed so that they may retain control over the instruments they have created. You are the instruments they created. They elected you in office and they probably will elect you out of office. That is the right of the public. The people have a right to access of information. They have a right to all documentation and everything that's been carried on in public meetings. The Brown Act says that local agencies shall be open to the public. All persons shall be attending any meeting of the legislative body. Your meetings must be open. There is no second thought. There is no separating the other languages to another room. There is no not providing Zoom, not providing public in-person meeting. You cannot get away with that. You've gotten away with it for too long and we no longer tolerate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up, we have Alejandro Cabrera followed by Ben Chafee. Apologies, Ben. Good evening, trustees. Um, I want to thank you all for having this public hearing today and uh, having a conversation about the need to move towards a single member election district. Uh, my name is Alejandro Cabrera and I'm here on behalf of Council Member Guerra, City of Sacramento District 6. Um, Councilman thinks it's important that the district moves towards uh, uh, single uh, member, smaller district representation that will allow board members to build a stronger connection with the school, with the, their schools and the families that they serve. Um, smaller member districts will ensure adequate geographic representation and accountability to voters by having an accessible rep representative. With that said, we want to thank all of our uh, board members who work hard, uh, long, long hours in unpaid part-time positions, building the trust and relations, relationships with our families and schools. In our council district, San Juan serves the neighborhoods of Sierra Oaks, Campus Commons, and East Ranch. We want to ensure that our board members have manageable size districts so that they can realistically do the work that needs to get done to uh, ensure the success of our students and our families. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Ben Chafee, followed by Mario Galvan. 
Yeah, good evening, members of the board. My name is Benjamin Chaffin, and I wanted to thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak here tonight and simply uh, express my strong support for the seven ward member map. Um, this district needs it as well as our students. Uh, you're in a unique position uh, to affect this important change and uh, support for a seven member uh, MAP is support for improved student outcomes uh, and support for our students in general. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Mario Galvan, followed by Diane Dekea. I'm sorry, I, no, there's a question mark here, so I think we're, we're trying to read from handwriting, but we'll begin with Mario. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here. My name is Mario Galvan. And uh, with all due respect to the board, uh, I also uh, want to address my comments to those uh, watching us uh, from outside on, uh, uh, on the media. Um, I ask that uh, people please insist on an open process in this uh, decision uh, using real 2020 data. Uh, we support the demand for seven trustees. We ask people send, to send their input to board comments at sanjuan.edu, but to also send a copy to the seven trustees uh, uh, at neighborhoodelections.com. Again, that's neighborhoodelections.com. Uh, if the district won't post public comments, we will. So for real information, please visit neighborhoodelections.com. We provide the demographic information that they don't. This can help you decide the community of interest to which you belong. Then you can tell the trustees how they should design seven trustee areas that will give you permanent representation. If you're registered to vote in San Juan, please sign our petition to that to the County Board of Education and consider the, that the County Board of Education consider the proposal for seven trustee areas. Even if the incumbents submit a five trustee map, you can sign here tonight at our table outside, or you can email seven trustees at neighborhoodelections.com, and we will make sure you get a petition to sign. Lastly, oh, excuse me, uh, trustee areas are supposed to group voters based on their community of interest. It means neighborhoods defined by common shopping and recreation areas, renters, language, education, and other democratic, excuse me, demographic demographic factors, including but not limited to race. If the district ignores voters' common interests, the board can gerrymander seats, five seats to try to keep safe as if they were Thank at you, large. Thank you, Mr. Galvan. That's the balance of your time. Thank you. Next up, we have Deanne. I'm going to let you say your last name. I don't think we have the right spelling here. Thank you for your attempt. It's Dion Dequa. Thank All you. Right. And I just, on, for on deck, we have Murad Sarama. That's fine. So please begin it, when you're It always gets mispronounced. But with only five seats and a rigged map, the voters don't stand a chance of actually selecting their own trustees. It is impossible for Citrus Heights to get its own seat. The trustee in Orangevale and one of the three Carmichael trustees will split the city, and that is one fourth of the district. Encina neighborhoods west of Watt and one fifth of the district have very distinct needs, and they too will never get a dedicated voice on the board. Since they are building blocks of trusted areas, it seems logical to look at communities first and then draw the maps. Tonight, they offer you no information except race that is set, that is set out on those uh, charts. And this is the last hearing before they draw the maps. They won't let you define your own neighborhoods. They don't care what you think your neighborhood is, whether your block is rich or poor, whether voters near or near you rent or own, or whether most adults have jobs or high school degrees. How many children go to school? Where, whether your neighborhood faces an environmental or economic challenges, whether there are many vacant homes or crowded housing, whether there are parks or bus stops or rail stops, libraries or shopping areas where people congregate and talk about politics. Tonight, they don't provide and won't use any information about crime in your area or about the quality of your neighborhood schools. 
They won't differentiate between established Latino neighborhoods and struggling immigrant communities. To them, all that matters is how many voters are Latino, Black, Asian, or Native American. If you are here tonight, you can see our maps showing all these factors or see them on your neighborhood elections.com on. Thank you. Next up, we have Murad Sarama, followed by Catherine Tarantini. President Viasquez, yes. we have hit our 30 minutes per board policy. We will need board action to extend. Thank you for the reminder. We have um, roughly 12 left for in-person comments. So moved. So I'd like to make a motion to extend public comment for the balance of our um, attendees here. It's been moved, I believe. I want to confirm that you're seconding that motion, Ms. Kreese, or moving the motion, Ms. Kreese. I, I am moving the motion. And there's a second from Ms. Costa. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 That was unanimous. Mr. Sarama, please begin. Thank you, uh, Madam President and uh, members of the board. Um, uh, actually, I'm standing before you tonight as a parent who lived in a district for almost two decades. Um, during these years, I witnessed that the, the diversity and inclusion evolve within the district from inclusion uh, within language accommodation to refugee, refugee students and parents to actually within the board. 20 years. Wow, what a change that I've seen, but I came into this board, so I'm glad to see that. For decades, Millions of Middle Eastern Americans like myself, my family, and I had no choice but to self-identify as white. So when we talk about census, it's usually a sore subject for my community. So I'm here, in short, I'm here tonight to support the bi-district election and a seven-member board to allow for a better engagement and representation in each district. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Catherine Tarantini, followed by Damaris Canton. Catherine? Do we have Ms. Tarantini with us? We're going to move to Ms. Canton, and we'll circle back to Ms. Tarantini. Ms. Canton. Good evening, board members. I first I'd like to good evening, board members. How um, I just want to address some of the comments that have been made tonight about the narrative that's been put out there that um, some of the comments led to led people to believe or would lead you to believe that the seven member board issue has been led by disgruntled people who ran for office and didn't get that. That's not at all how it happened. It has been led by parents who have been in this district for 20 to 25 years, who reached out to those people who ran for office, who then joined and said, we will help. Because as we have seen, we cannot get people elected in this school district if the school district, if the school, the teachers union is not for them. Moving to seven gives us smaller areas, gives us an opportunity to focus. I have spoken with each and every one of you about the needs at Encina High School in the West End. 25 years, and we still have so many of the same issues. If we had a board member who lived in that neighborhood, who met with their constituents on a regular basis, who had access, we wouldn't have this issue. I can tell you, I bet that Mr. Kern, he can ha he'll have real parents in his office. How many Encina parents have, come, have been able to go to his office and have a conversation with him? And through no fault of his, who lets, nobody's letting them in there. We have to do better than this. Our students deserve it. Our community deserves it. I live in this community. I've educated three children in this community. We are moving, we need to move to seven so that we can give good representation. Living in Fair Oaks, does not give you a good idea of how life is in Citrus Heights or on the West End. So I thank you for the time, but please don't listen to the narrative of those who want to keep it this way so they can continue to be incompetent. Thank, thank you, Ms. Canton. 
Is Miss Catherine Tarantini here? Okay, we will move on to Lisa Pelletier, followed by Faith Arguello. That's my best guess, apologies. Lisa, please begin when you're ready. Thank you, I'm ready. My name is Lisa Pelletier. I had three children in San Juan Unified until COVID hit. And in my opinion, the board and the superintendent uh, shut down, refused to listen to parents, refused to do what's best for the kids, lied to us, betrayed us, left our kids hanging out to dry. And I know I'm not alone. I was so disappointed to hear today your comments about the mapping. Um, not one of you said, I really wanna connect with the parents who are frustrated. I wanna help the kids who are hurting and failing and cutting themselves and committing suicide and suffering from bullying by teachers and peers who insist on people with medical exemptions wearing masks anyway. I was hoping you guys would say something like that, but instead, Mr. Hernandez offers that maybe we should look at square miles when we determine representation. Square miles, we are people. We are people and your obligation is to represent us. This is for the viewers. Please visit recallsanjuanunifiedboe.org. We have recall petitions for all of them. People like me who lead the parents need to be on that board right over there. The mapping is important. Please go to this website, neighborhoodelections.com. You're gonna communicate with us we're gonna to band together. We're gonna to fix the district so our kids can come back. We're gonna end critical race. We're gonna bring local control back to San Juan Unified so you feel safe sending your child to school and you know you have a voice. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have Faith. Faith Arguello. Art with, possibly with the T, I'm so sorry. <laughs> and then followed by uh, her is uh, Scott Rafferty. Thank you, ma'am. Please begin when you're ready. Uh, yeah, thank you, Faith Atagwile. Okay. So, but don't worry, it gets mispronounced all the time. So I do my best not to, but right. please. <laughs> so continue, continuing with the previous comments, I just wanna say that last year, the board said it was wrong to comply in 2020 because using the 2010 census to determine the area size somehow left out refugees, even though their areas may have lost population. Once they got their at-large election, the board reversed itself, insisting on using 2010 data. The 2020 census is almost certainly the least accurate in recent history. Still, the district must use 2020 data in the next election, so it makes no sense to draw maps to nowhere. This census has enormous uncertainty, but for heroic efforts by our state government, there would be a huge undercount of urban areas and of Latinos. It is difficult to imagine where undercount could matter more than within San Juan. Orangevale had one of the highest self-response rates in the state, west of Watt amongst the lowest. Having claimed that this census would differ radically from 2010, San Juan now says that there will be almost no change in its population. Their private data from Geolytics says it has increased only 10,500. The census says 17,000. The odds that the census overestimated growth by 70% is about one in 300,000. Both data sets show big shifts within San Juan. The demographer says Encina and Citrus Heights grew, many blocks doubling in population. Areas where trustees live declined. The census estimates change in 85 tracts, not 3,700 blocks, but shows a similar disparity. It is likely true. Thank you, ma'am. That's the balance of okay. your two minutes. Thank you. Next up, we have Scott Rafferty, followed by Bill Simmons. So we had a script tonight. We didn't finish it because there were just so many other really important things to say. Uh, but uh, we've sent you over 40 pages of data and maps 
and, and examples and, and, and none of it gets posted. None of it ever, not even our original petition. And uh, this just isn't, isn't democracy. Uh, you, read, you read written comments very selectively. Uh, you discriminate based on viewpoint. Uh, but uh, uh, your, your data here from all these private sources that Tushy Hernandez has or your demographer has, uh, it's just not right. It's not the official data. You need to use the official data. And that's what we've given you about school size and, and trustee size. Uh, and uh, you just need to be more open and listen to the community. I do appreciate, President Velasquez, that you recognize that there were different uh, uh, parts of Arden Arcade, uh, especially east of, of Watt is, is, is different. Uh, and what we've given you information about crime, about all the barriers to participation in government, and this reform is meant to empower those communities. And yes, it's good for everyone. It's good for all neighborhoods. The Citrus Heights, they haven't had somebody on the board for 19 years. And, and they're a quarter of the district. And, and their needs were very different than, than, than Arden Arcade. They need to have a voice on this board. They don't need to be split up between uh, someone in Orangeville and someone in Carmichael. And with five seats, if you do criteria number eight, where you're protecting yourselves, everybody gets their own district, uh, there's no room for them. It's, it's, it's over. We've given you the seven member option because it is the norm. You are one of the biggest in the country to not, to have, not to have only five members and one of the only ones that's large at large. So please take it seriously. If you say seven districts tonight, we'll settle the lawsuit. It'll be over. Thank you, Mr. Rafferty. Next up, we have Bill Simmons followed by David Hawkins. Members of the board, Superintendent Kern, my name is Bill Simmons. I've lived in the district for 32 years and voted in every election for this board. I, I also know that this board has done great things at school sites around our district and they have um, served the students in Arden Arcade by rebuilding Dyer Kelly, by rebuilding Greer, by rebuilding um, Del Paso Manor. If we had a seven member board representing seven districts like many of our neighbors do, there would not be consensus to serve the needs of the most neediest schools. This board has done a great job. We have 60% of the board are minorities. That's not recognized by Mr. Rafferty's group. But Mr. Rafferty doesn't live in the district. Mr. Rafferty has made money off of this as an attorney. And he has got a group of disgruntled politicians that lost board seats to come to this board and to make statements. You will notice that there were many members that came up here tonight and spoke to you. They do not live in the district. They live outside the district and have come with Mr. Rafferty to make noise. Listen to the voters in the district. Listen to the people who you represent. You represent the people who live in this district. Thank you. Thank you. Before we move on, everybody will get equal time to make their say, and we appreciate folks being, you can make hand gestures, you can, but please just do it quietly. Um, next up, we have David Hawkins, followed by Michelle Wright. Hi everyone, uh, David Hawkins. Uh, I, I actually live in the district. Um, I actually have uh, two sons that have gone through uh, San Juan. Um, one at Del Campo, which was not the greatest experience and our youngest who's now at uh, uh, San Juan High School. Um, I'm a labor advocate, that's what I do for a living. And frankly, I'm embarrassed by some of the comments of the union. Um, I think what would be helpful I think what would be, no, we don't need snapping. This is, I think this would be helpful. There are narratives that, that people are 
putting in place. There are assumptions that people are putting in place. There are misunderstandings that people have put in place because the stakeholders aren't talking with each other. And I think that that's a disservice to the board to have people come up and oppose or, sub or support something based on what the latest catchy phrase is versus what is the impact on our students in the community. Um, and that's what I'd like to um, try to touch on. Um, President Viasquez, I'd, I'd like to thank you, first of all, for, for your clarifying questions. I was looking through the resolution and I, and I saw the piece on draft maps. I didn't know if it was five or seven. And, and I don't think you've decided, maybe you have, but I have not come to the conclusion that this board's decided that it needs to be a five or, or a seven seat um, conclusion. Um, I was honored to be appointed to the inaugural LCAP committee by a member of this group when she was president in 2014, no one was in fourth grade. And we had a very nice conversation about the diverse needs of the district and about the need to be inclusive of the members of this, of this district who were not being included at the time, and that was seven years ago. And it seems to me that if we open dialogue and have some conversations, we might be able to be more inclusive with, with a larger board. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hawkins. Next, we have Michelle Wright, followed by Michael Nishimura. Nishimura. Hi, I'm Michelle Wright. I'm a Fair Oaks resident and I grew up going to schools in Fair Oaks. And I have benefited from overrepresentation. So I am actually in support now of a seven member by district board um, because I don't think um, people from my neighborhoods actually need continued overrepresentation. I think it would benefit everyone and especially students who are at schools that don't perform as well as the schools I went to, um, to have increased representation, um, to have people that understand their backgrounds and what they, and their experiences. Um, because I think in designing education, their education, they need people that understand where they come from. Um, so the more access we have, the greater, um, inclusiveness and um, people that are more represent representative of each of the communities, I think that would just allow for increased, um, a better reflection through your policies um, in, in, how you, in how you govern this, uh, this uh, the, sorry, <laughs> this district. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Michael Nishimura. Followed by Herman Barahona. Thank you, board members. Um, my name is Mike Nishimura. I'm the vice president of the Re Residents Empowerment Association of Citrus Heights. I'm also on the board for our neighborhood association. And I'm also planning commissioner for the city of Citrus Heights. I'm very happy that you are moving over from at large elections to um, by, de um, by trustee. I would really like to see it go to seven trustees just to be more it would make it a lot more fair and equitable be a lot easier to draw the maps citrus heights represents almost 25 percent of the district the students yet we have not had any representation for almost 19 well 19 years almost 20 years so i think that it's high time and I just feel that seven seats would make it a lot more equitable and fair for everybody involved. I was not quite aware of the problems that, you know, our Narcade area had. So I would really like you to consider the seven trustee area. And to the comment that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I'm sorry, but it is. My own stepdaughter lives in Citrus Heights. She owns her home and the charter schools are coming. We have one opening up in our neighborhood association and she's gone so far as to check into sending her daughter, my granddaughter, who starts school next year, sending her into Placer County because of the performance of the schools in Citrus Heights. And I don't wanna see that. I'd like to see it fixed. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Next we have 
Carmen Barahona, followed by Teresa Amador. Good evening, members of the board, superintendent. Uh, thank you for having us here today. I know it's a long night. Uh, I'm a parent here in San Juan Unified. I'm a voter here. And I am very disappointed to see that the results and net data to report that black and brown kids are suspended the highest rates than any other ethnic group in the school district. And Sina High School still doesn't have an engineering and technology program like Rio Americano does. So we hope that this efforts to increase the representation at the local level can create a kind of small learning community where we can hold somebody accountable to bring those resources to our neighborhoods. And I'm in full support of this. I'm also here on behalf of uh, my organization that I'm part of, it's called United Latinos. We're a health and environmental justice organization that's uh, funded by different groups here in town. And we've been meeting with the Community Action Network to keep an eye on this effort because it's very important to us. So I have their full support from the board and their membership that uh, I'm here to speak on their behalf to say that we do support the seven district uh, system. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Teresa Amador followed by Jocelyn Milan. Good evening, thank you for having me. My name is Teresa Amador. I am a parent of three children, one in elementary, one in middle school and one in high school. Um, I am not a disgruntled politician. I'm a homeowner and I reside within the district in the boundaries and um, I am in support of a seven trustee map. Um, I've worked for 23 years with special education. I've been an independent consultant in districts within no across Northern California. Um, I've also been in Kansas, Colorado. I've seen how different districts do it. I grew up in a rural community um, where we had representation and <coughs> my mother served on the board there and was able to see the impact that they had by representing. I came from an affluent area where my school was in a small farm town and it was rural and we were able to, to get the community to work together. And I feel it's important to have individual representation. Student outcome is important. And I think it's really important that the board look at and define what run successfully means. Um, as a parent and a homeowner, I define that as student outcome, test scores, um, dropouts, district rankings, um, number of suicides that's happened, um, housing, business, cost of living. As, as somebody who owns a home, it's important for me to keep that and have that value. And when I'm looking at other areas to relocate or move, the first thing I look at as a parent is what are the schools performing at and how successful they are. And I, and I look at our response to COVID and during a board meeting, um, Mr. Kent Kern spoke and said that we are such, we have so many moving parts. It's really difficult to get anything moving and working together. We're really working really hard. Well, that's my point for looking at, yes, a car has many moving parts too, but if we just look at it as this whole and the engine lights on and we don't do anything about what's happening and what needs to happen to improve equitability, how resources is funding and allocated, how many communities are underrepresented, how many areas have Title I schools and have heavily impacted that don't have that individual representation, I think is very important. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Jocelyn Milan. Good evening, everyone. We are here as graduates of Citrus Heights Schools, San Juan High School graduates, a graduate of UC Davis and Sacramento State. We are both currently in master's programs. We thank you for your leadership and support, a five board member. Thank you. Thank you. That is the end of our um, public comment for individuals who've signed up to here in person. Um, as was um, announced at the beginning of the meeting for this series of special meetings, we will also be reading written comment, and I'll turn to Mr. Allen to help facilitate that. Certainly, President Viasquez, we have seven comments that have been submitted tonight, including those received before 6 p.m. tonight. Our first comes from Elizabeth Roten, who writes, I am in support of redrawing the district map to include seven neighborhoods instead of the current five. San Juan is a very large district, and including more voices in school district decisions is incredibly important for ensuring that community voices are heard and considered. Having communities speak to their needs is vital for making sure they are being served by the district. 
Expansion from five to seven seems like a very reasonable way of getting more communities involved and giving them the opportunity to advocate for their needs. Our next comment is from Nina Mancina, who writes, I've thought a lot about the issues surrounding the board discussion tonight. I can see how on paper it makes sense to expand board membership to enhance community representation, but I can't help but wonder if this move will result in the exact opposite. In looking at the research around effective school boards, the one thing that jumps out is the importance of collaboration and building a strong team. Several studies caution that a board can become ineffective when members focus on the interests of a specific neighborhood over the interests of the district as a whole. While each of the communities in San Juan is unique, I believe it is my job as a community member to bring those needs to the attention of the board. It is the board's job to think about them in the context of the whole in order to ensure that we are doing our best work for all the students we serve. In order to do this well, the board needs to be collaborative and respect each other's points of view, something I fear will become more difficult if the size of the board is increased. As I stated earlier, I can see why people believe that expanding the size of the board and creating trusty areas will improve representation, but without intentionality, this is not guaranteed. So I ask that you consider what steps you will take, no matter the decision, to build a strong board that engages in effective dialogue and mutual respect for the good of the whole. Our next comment comes from Michael Seaman, who writes, as I commented for your postponed June 15th meeting, I prefer seven districts, not five, so that disadvantaged and or historically neglected communities for example, West Arden Arcade, North Highlands, Citrus Heights, West Carmichael, et cetera, will be represented on the school board. I appreciate that SJUSD will be using 2020 census data, even though the data are late. The seven districts should be apportioned by a population density and seek to maintain the integrity of neighborhoods, communities, and unincorporated areas with consideration for racial, ethnic, and economic de demography. It would be wrong to slice districts such that trustees from affluent areas west of Watt, but south of Northrop or east of Watt from Arden Oaks southward to the river will get to speak for the diverse comparatively disadvantaged densely populated areas to their north. At least one trustee area should cover the area north of Northrop and west of Watt, as that area has no middle schools, a neglected high school, too many charter schools, several closed school sites, abundant rental housing, and a significant homeless population. Our next comment is from Alan Lovett, who writes, as a voter in the community for 42 years, I want the board members to know that most of us in the community want five trustee areas. We want more teachers, counselors, teachers aides, and social workers. We do not need more board members. Districts around us with seven board members are highly dysfunctional. We want to have a highly functional five member board. Our next comment is from somebody whose name is entered as Tommy Nelson. I support the board in moving to trustee areas. I support you exploring both a five or seven member board, whatever provides the best governance for our students. What I don't support are attorneys like Scott Rafferty trying to get rich off the process. For the past decade or longer, Rafferty has been going up and down the state, sending out threatening letters to school boards and city councils, warning them that if they fail to acquiesce to his demand, will bring legal action against the school district or the city, the kind of legal action that can potentially cost a school board, a school district or city more than a million dollars in legal fees. In his petition, he notes that election code allows plaintiff attorneys to collect fees of up to $33,000 for working on the petition, and that doesn't include far steeper fees that may result if the case ends up in court. Many believe attorneys such as Rafferty are in it for the payout. Rafferty says the legal actions are about establishing fair elections that will ultimately improve city services and create opportunities in every part of the city. If that was truly what you believe, Mr. Rafferty, then acknowledge the district has started the process to move to buy trustee area elections, collect your $33,000 $33, and move on or stay and prove to everyone that you are looking for a much bigger payout. Public, spend a couple of minutes researching this man and you will know what type of person he is greedy and taking money from our kids. Our next comment is from John Carranzas who writes, you do not listen. We are still suffering from COVID. Our caregiver died. We cannot leave our children alone all evening. Where else in California is anyone requiring people to show up in person just to be heard? You care about, you care only about yourselves. That's why we need seven trustees. And our final comment is anonymous who writes, you should not require identification on your form. We have good reason to be anonymous. I do not want to be attacked personally like trustee Creason did to Austin Schlocker 
We need seven tr area trustees so everyone has someone accountable to them, not to the special interests. And that's the end of our public comment. Um, we will then bring it back to uh, the dais for comments and discussions. We're going to do another round down the dais. Um, again, just to repeat, I am kind of taking notes at some point, we will have to return to actual like the, the text of the criteria and what we want to adopt, but um, I'll continue to listen and we'll have some discussion first. Mr. Hernandez. Um, I personally want to appreciate everyone uh, who made a comment. Um, I, uh, I do appreciate uh, those uh, four that support seven, those that uh, support five, and those that are looking out for uh, specific interest um, and the need for their community. Um, and I, I think that's the great thing about being part of our democracy, that we are able to be heard. And again, I do appreciate, I want you to know very much, and I appreciate those comments directed to me. Um, because more than anything, I think it makes us all think. And um, and again, I, I, I stick to my comment that I, I'm looking forward to hearing everybody's point of view and which will help me come up with a decision. And especially uh, I want to point out one more time that uh, I do not, I am not prom uh, pro promoting seven or five at this time. I, um, I really do want to hear all the parties involved and um, more than anything, I appreciate all the people that came out here publicly to make their comment heard. So thank you so very much. And as far as uh, interest is concerned, I, I support all the ideas that have been already uh, been addressed. And, um, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hernandez. And while I acknowledge that that was the end of the public comment, I did not formally end the public hearing. So oh, I'm so sorry. That was, it was, there's nothing for you to apologize to. That was totally on me. So I uh, formally declare the public hearing closed. We will come back to the board. Ms. Costa. I agree with Mr. Hernandez. Uh, I really appreciate all the people who came and who spoke and the people who are on YouTube listening and providing written comment. I have not made up my mind. Uh, I really am interested in community input, and I really would like to hear what people are thinking, and that's why I listed the dates of the public meetings uh, earlier, because I think that it is really important that we hear from the widest number of people possible what their thinking is. Uh, as I said earlier, the emails that I'm receiving are all over the place, as well as the phone calls. So I think the more people we hear from, the better it will be in terms of our decision making. Ms. Creason. Thank you. I do want to address some of the public comments, if that's okay. All right. Um, it seemed to me in some of the comments, it sounded as if folks think decisions have been made and they haven't. And that's why we're having these hearings and there's more hearings to come to help inform the decision. Thank goodness. Uh, that's what I came here to do is to represent community. So I'm not sure if maybe I'm misunderstanding or others are misunderstanding, but no decisions have been made. Um, there is a couple of comments about from a couple of people about engaging with community that we should be engaging with community to talk about this issue and that there should be more stakeholder engagement as a whole. And I agree 100%. And I just want to be very transparent that I have, I try to call back or email back anyone that emails me. Where it gets tricky is where there's a lawsuit. I'm not allowed to anymore. I can't talk about what's in the lawsuit, especially with who's suing us. And I, just to be very transparent, I got a phone call. I had one phone call with a community me member. The next day, we got that letter. And that stopped it. I couldn't. So I just want it to be known that I'm, I wish that we could just sit down at, at Milagro and talk it out. Because this is an important decision that has to happen. I've always been transparent that this is something that needs to happen. So I just wanted to put that out there. Um, regarding census, census has come up several times. Census was not a part of any of our decision-making at all. I have said many times that I wish that we could have wait, waited, and that was always my intent, and I've made this very clear. For 2022 election, 
which is when I'm up for re-election, has nothing to do with incumbency for me, that we should be by district. And the reason why is because census would be out. This is way before COVID and that we knew that things were going to be the way they were. That was my personal want. That never was a part of the decision-making because there was a lawsuit. And so it kind of changed the trajectory of how things were done. So I just want to make that clear. Yes, I wish we could have waited for census 100%. I've met, said it a million times. COVID messed up everything, including the data we're going to get. And I recognize that. Um, and it's unfortunate. And we should go with the best data that we have. But I think the law is going to force on ha our hand on the data we get to use. And it's my understanding that will be 2020 census data, nobody else's data. And then we'll do it again in 2022 because we have to, or uh, with the 2020, I'm sorry, we're going to use, start with the 2010 data and then we have to do it again with the 2020 data because we have to. Do we have a choice? Okay. Okay. Um, I, I was writing notes the whole time. I literally have a tally of who wants what. <laughs> um, there's a lot of good ideas that I was able to grab from this. But I got to say, too, um, this is the people system. I believe that 100%. Um, so it is hard because I am a parent. I do have a kid. I am an advocate that got elected in 2018. I've always been for the people. I came from the hood. Um, so it's hard when I hear people say that you're only out for your self-interest because that's just not true. And I heard somebody talk about critical race theory. If you want to recall me for caring about uh, people of color, recall me. I'm all right with that. I will never, ever bow down to that, ever. Um, just know that we're people too. You know, I mean, that's not what we're here to be like, oh, feel for us. It's not that. But I mean, this should, in my view, this should be a dialogue so we could get where we want to be as a community. Um, I'll leave it there. Um, Sorry, I had a lot of notes. I want to make sure that I. One clarification that I do want to make too, it's my understanding that even when we go by district, that we are responsible for the district as a whole, not just our area. Is that accurate? Yes, that, that is accurate. And if it helps at all. I'll just take an opportunity to add. I went back and listened to our March 10th initial hearing meeting over a year ago at this point, and it was a unanimous um, sentiment amongst us all that regardless of what happened, we would do what we could to set the norm to make sure that the governance yeah. team that succeeds us does so with intention and watching out for the entire district. So yes. I think that's an important point. And again, I touched on this before we went into public comment and it's really weighing heavy on me. We're gonna be a, we're, we're gonna have to work as a community to address the fact that we're an open enrollment district. <laughs> we're an open enrollment district. So although we're gonna be voting, voted in by the people or maybe one of you are gonna be voted in by the people in your community, not all of them are gonna to go to school in your community. So that's just, and again, that's not something we're gonna be able to resolve on dais tonight, but it's something that I hope that we all can really think about because that's the real stuff that's gonna affect kids that we're gonna to have to talk out and figure out what that means and how do we represent our kids. I mean, I'm gonna probably be in that boat too. You know, if I happen to be reelected, if not, I get my evenings back. Um, I can help out in other ways, but it's very possible that my son will be going to a school that's not in a district that I represent. Um, and so what do you know, how do we, how we navigate that? I don't know. And that's not just me as a board member, but as the community that's voting too. Just something to think about. I hope we all can work together to figure out how we do, how, how we address that. Ms. Creason, can I speak? That may actually end up being a benefit to helping us um, try and represent more than just an individual area um, because you will know that you're representing folks that voted for you who have students in other parts of the district. You know, one of the things I think we've heard, and we've heard this for a while, is that idea of having a connection to a, a board member in a region. And, and you know, as you try and engage the community, I think that's, that's something that by, <coughs> pardon me, by going to trustee areas allows. Yeah, and I, I hope none of that comes off as if I was trying to minimize the relationship that comes from having your own member. Absolutely, that's 100% true and I agree with that and I'm glad we're going that way, but it's just a layer that 
I don't know, I think we should talk about it. That's enough for me. Thank you. Dr. McKibben. A uh, couple things. First of all, thank all of you, uh, those of you who showed up uh, and, and came here, those of you who offered written comments and that sort of thing, they're all very important and, and that uh, I think all of us were taking notes and we really appreciate you being part of this democratic process <laughs> and, and saying to us what you feel and what you believe. I wanna join this conversation uh, that, and talk a bit about who we represent. In many cases, of course, we all represent the voters. Uh, you have to recognize that only about 20% of the people in this school district actually have children in schools. Now, we do indeed represent them, and they're very important. But we also represent the other 80%, and that's the thing. In fact, none of us could get elected without those people who do not have children in the schools. And it's very important because those kids come back to our, our communities and become community members. So investing in all of our kids and listening to all of the people is very important. One of the dilemmas that, that uh, I think that we face as a school board is exactly the point that I think Mr. Kern was making is that over the, over the last uh, six to seven years that I've been a school board member, that I've tried to do both. One is you know, to join organizations like the Orangevale Community Council and that sort of thing, because those people re uh, talk to the other people in the community. But in fact, if you look at the mileage on my car, in fact, that for many of us, I think for virtually all of us, we've visited every school in the community because we wanna hear about all of the different kinds of programs. And that's the thing. I'm worried that there will be less of that, but I think that we will all work indeed to not have that. In fact, in fact, uh, uh, before COVID, that I had spent about five times as much time on the west side of the district that on the east side of the district where I live. I think that will continue with boards if we, uh, if we vote for responsible people. But the notion is that, that indeed uh, for 16 years of, uh, of my career, I spent 100,000 miles around the state talking to school districts and, and I was the director of teacher development uh, uh, and bringing teachers of color into classrooms. Did that. And I will tell you that there wasn't, uh, that many of the boards, the best boards that I dealt with that did the best job of bringing people of color into our classrooms were on five member boards. It did not ma matter much on that. So the, the notion of having larger boards necessarily makes better government just doesn't have a ring of truth to it. Thank you, Dr. McKibben. Um, I will just echo thanks for everybody who has engaged in this stage of the process and take one last opportunity to emphasize this is um, an, a step in a multi-step process that will continue through the summer. Um, and so we will, um, all of the, the meetings are now will, are in the board packet and we will continue to um, advertise that process and, and work to get the word out. Um, I do want to turn my colleagues' attention to um, the criteria of um, the establishment of trustee areas, which is an action item for the evening. Um, and I was listening closely, so I have a proposed method forward and then want to open it for discussions, um, which is um, my proposal is to add here as the 11th criteria, I, I can just have the paper out here, um, the, the item around each district having one high school that Ms. Costa proposed. Um, and then once we, if I wanna see if there's anything else we want to add, and then we will have a quick discussion of what we don't want included, and then hopefully be able to take a vote on what remains, if that works for folks. Is there any, I'm getting universal head nodding just for those, for our audience at, at home. Um, what I just have officially written down, just so you know, Ms. Costa, the boundaries of the trustee area shall include at least one high school or more. Um, 
So that would be 11. That would be item number 11. Is there anything else here that we would want to directly add to this? And again, distinguishing between this and the information that was shared that our demographers will take back. I'm sure they've been listening very, very intently. Um, I didn't hear a specific additional item here, but I want to see if I am wrong. Mr. Hernandez. I just want to make an emphasis. I don't know if we have to put it in there. It may be just a focus because serving a, a liaison as a, the facility member, I think it's important that those lines be uh, um, drawn in a way that if there's a safety issue that a child does not have to cross a big street, Sunrise, Hazel, Dewey, Greenback, Fair Oaks Boulevard. You see what I mean? If those big streets can help to, for safety reasons, that we pay attention to that because I think it's important for our, our kids that are traveling that we do, if possible, uh, pay attention to those big streets. And I think he mentioned it in the criteria, but I think it's um, for safety factors that we pay attention to it. That's all. Do you think that it's adequately captured in seven? Where I, I think it is. But okay, I, I, I just want to confirm. I think more for slash safety underneath that for for transportation for those students that walk. <coughs> so, do you want to add and safety considerations here? Yes. Is there are there any objections to that? Feel free to take a moment to think about it. I don't see any objections, but we're going to continue the conversation. So, if you change your mind, let me know. Okay. Miss Costa, Miss Creason. point came up, and this is something I have spoke on a couple of times when we're going over data, is the fact that um, a lot of our, a lot of immigrant communities are jumbled as white. And we know that our immigrant communities have unique needs. Um, so do I understand correctly that item six, communities of interest, make sure that we're considering that, or do we need something else to make sure that we're considering communities that aren't the white that we think about <laughs> when we say white? No, I think that captures it. I will say that there's a limit to what the census will look at and the data that we will have. So I think throughout the, you know, the process is intended to look at a map and say, wait, hold on a sec. This is dividing a unique community in this area and we need to think about that. And so, because we're going to have multiple opportunities to look at maps, to, to evaluate them on the criteria that we mentioned and are very clearly prescribed uh, in federal and state law. Um, but then there's also the, from you as board members, from the community that comes out and brings things to our attention that, oh, you know what, you're right. We should go back and see if there's a way to keep that community together. So, um, just to clarify, there was some comments earlier about the data that we use. We're, we're required to use census data, as you pointed out, but we can also look outside of that and we can incorporate other things that, you know, frankly, there's not as formalized a process for gathering that data or quantifying it. We can try to come up with other ways to make sure it reflects, again, those communities of interest um, and that we're, we're capturing that properly. I appreciate that. And I don't propose to know the how we get there, <laughs> but the what really is concerning to me, right? I want to make sure that we do that appropriately. And I'm not, so some, this is what I think about when we're talking about some communities, especially if we're talking about immigrant, refugee, newcomer communities, we know that it's, that those families don't often show up to stuff like this. So they may not be around to point out a map saying, hey, you're, blow, you know, separating my community on this map. And so we're relying on those of us that are a part of that community to be able to call that out. So I guess I'm just, and again, I'm not proposing to know how to address that, but that is a concern that I would like to be addressed to make sure we don't do that. Can I jump in with a potential suggestion, which I think communities of interest is inclusive of that. And so we are therefore not limited just to the census data. Right. However, I wonder one, if it's legally permissible, so I'll just get the lawyers in the room to perk Looking up a little bit. Um, <laughs> just to add maybe to item six, um, a sentence that says, you know, this may include the district information, the use of district information allowable for use in accordance with privacy laws regarding enrollment and service provisions. 
I think that makes sense. Well, we can add the um, the catch-all insofar as practicable, which I actually hate the language of, but doing this for a living, it's usually what we add at the end. <laughs> well, we won't get into that right now. Sure, but it would just be inclusive of district data that we could use. Again, it wouldn't be include data that we're not allowed to use for HIPAA and other reasons, but that privacy provisions worked in there as well. And I'm not proposing we know how, the how to get there, but if we could just have a placeholder so we do figure that out as we're going through the process, I, I'm comfortable with that. I don't know how. Well, it's also a may, so it's not like we have to use it, but it's there and it calls it out. Because that helps. Long. I mean, because I, I know I'm talking about a specific community that is jumped, at, you know, put into this one bu bucket, but that's, it, I mean, this is with all communities and the problem with that aggregation, aggregated da data, right? We know. <laughs> Um, Asian is, is a whole lot of communities. We know that um, some communities, um, some low-income communities, just, you know, it's not the same engagement level. So I want to make sure, sure their voice is heard. And that said, it's my understanding that we, once we get to the map piece, we will be accepting comments via Zoom. Is that correct? Uh, when we do those community meetings? Yeah, when yeah, we actually yeah. have the maps out yeah, there. Yeah. So we're going to do, we're going to have in-person yeah. and there's going to be yeah. Zoom. Uh, one okay. of the things that I was going to say around that is uh, we have some data specific to our schools related to immigrant populations. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder if we could provide that to the demographer because when we talk about communities of interest, and I can't remember what community member said it tonight about individuals who are, whether they're playing youth <laughs> sports together or they're shopping in certain areas, that can be affected by those communities of interest. Mm -hmm. And so we could try and provide some of that um, data as, as soon as possible so that you could see that. Yeah. Thank you. So we can do that without adding it into the criteria. Is that sufficient or do you want language specifically calling out non-census data, which I think is probably more of a- And as long as we're committing to do it, that's all I need. Okay. If, if, if we're doing it and that number six, <laughs> yeah, I, you know, one of the challenges we're faced with in this compressed timeline is you have a map to produce, first maps to produce in five days, and two of those days of the weekend, and we have a lot of staff that are out right now, or have just retired as of yesterday, um, and so we, that, we'll do what we can to get you that, but that could, that could be a challenge. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll We'll do what we can. You know, one of the things that I wanted to share about the community meetings as well, because we talked at the last time about what ways could we really try and get that information out to everybody. We have, and, and Trent, do you want to speak to this real quick in terms of the mailer that we're trying to send out to every member of our community? Maybe. There we go. So we do have uh, several different avenues we are using to reach out. One is a community-wide mailer, so it will go to every household within the district. It's actually been a long time since we've done a piece of snail mail to everybody um, in the district, whether they're a, a family or not. Um, so that will be going out, uh, should be hitting mailboxes uh, towards mid next week or end of next week, English and Spanish with links to uh, materials and other languages provided online. Uh, we do have calls going out via our systems, our social media as well. The website's really that hub where all of the materials are available in multiple languages. Um, and then we do have um, multiple advertisements going up in the local newspapers, um, as well as media releases going out next week. No, I know we kind of talked about it, but can we do the, like, um, ah, at lunch distributions provide flyers? Because I think that'll hit a little... Okay. Yeah, we could, we could try something like that. <laughs> Hopefully the, the mailer, yeah, we can, we could add that to it. The mailers to every household in the district really encompasses. Um, it gets that, everyone uh, once. Yep. It'll, you know, because we're doing social media, you yep. know, that'll hit some people twice. Yeah, so no, lunch we can, might we hit. Can, we can add that. I, I, I think just, we were I want to thank you yeah. for following up on that. I really do. And I know it puts staff in a, tight timeline to get a mailer out to every household in this district. But that really, I think, allows us to engage 
every community member who wants to be engaged. So thank you for following up. Yeah, we, we really wanted to, the, the, and, and we, can, we can do it at where we pass out the meals as well. The challenge there is most of that is our school community. And we really wanted to find a way that we could get to broader than just our school community. Um, as I think Dr. McKibben, you mentioned the majority of our, our district do not have students in our school system. Um, and so how do you reach those families? Because we do know that there, there are folks out there. Um, I mean, I think we had a couple emails in tonight that aren't necessarily folks with students, but they, they wanted to have their voice heard. And so that's, that's part of the process. We did not want it to, we, we wanted to try and explore every way possible in the short time frame that we could get the information out. I totally understand. And I absolutely agree that we have to hit everybody that has voice in our community. Um, I'm the only parent, <laughs> you know, our, with a kid currently in a district school. And so my lens does tend to go towards, you know, what can we do at the school site? But that in no way is intended to diminish um, community as a whole. It's just uplifting school sites. Before I move to Dr. McKibben, I just want to make clear that we're, we're good with number six and it inc being inclusive of of other communities not captured by census data. So the boundaries of the trustee areas may observe communities of interest. That's good. We haven't gotten there yet. We're still we're still on that additions. We'll we'll come circle back to any um, <coughs> taking anything else. Dr. McKibben. Uh, I have uh, well about three. Uh, one is that the uh, related to the gerrymandering piece. I do think that we should. Uh, either have incumbency as a very low priority or as uh, not one of our criteria. I think that it tends to get in the way of, uh, uh, of putting our districts uh, into things that look like uh, sponges rather than uh, the compactness that the other criteria have. So that's my first. Uh, the second one has to do with, I appreciate the adding, you know, the other interest groups like immigrants and, and uh, those former refugees and things like that to, into the group. And finally, I think that uh, in the notion that keeping communities together, uh, and not only the high schools, but the high schools and the recognizing that uh, uh, the high schools represent more than people in schools, but represent the whole community. And we are after all a community school district and so we ought to have, keep those people about. That's why I really appreciate the uh, snail mail uh, going out on this one because it really does recognize how important this vote is and that everybody ought to be involved. Thank you, Dr. McKibben. And that actually brings me to the point that I wanted to clarify, which was, um, you know, by discussing it, our team will be taking it into consideration. It doesn't need to be captured here, but there was a distinction brought up earlier, which is the difference between including or considering the physical location of a high school and including or considering where those students live. Like that's a, those are two different things. And I'm just curious if folks have input. I, I interpreted it to mean when I, do, when I think of kind of feeder patterns and matriculation of school sites, et cetera, I'm keeping in mind where the students live but i think practically it would have to be based on the like physical location of those high schools will you turn on your um, mic mic <laughs> is, is that synonymous with boundaries because i you know i suppose it is yeah but again that's for our boundary schools right miss creason so that gets tricky again so we're thinking about el camino it's 100 percent. oh your mic yep I wasn't. It's a little. Um, El Camino is a great example of a school that doesn't have any boundaries. It's 100% open enrollment. So how I don't know that that can fit into that criteria. So and again, and I'm sorry to be a broken record, but we're an open enrollment school. So that I think further complicates it because we can't really say the kids go to this school just because they live there. Um, so to me, that means that we have to do just physical school site. Mr. Hernandez. You know, Ms. Creason, I think that El Camino is a pure open enrollment, but I think by boundary, there is a boundary set by the schools where they sit geographically. Isn't that correct? 
Well, our non-boundary schools have this area around it. This we call it a forty percent area where those individuals have, but it those schools really are non-boundaried. Um, so we we have some unique challenges when we look at boundaries. And again, I think going back, I actually in watching one of the other districts again, they their their board talked about let's let's try and split boundaries because then at least two board members have involvement in, in, in a school rather than it just being owned by one. And so different districts do this very differently. I think um, as you know, was presented to us tonight, some of these things are going to have to take priority of others. Even your comment about like major thoroughfares, our boundaries don't take all of those things into consideration all the time. So there may be a boundary for a high school where you absolutely have to cross certain major thoroughfares. So there's there's going to come some complications in this, and and really, then what is the prioritization? I think that will be the great part about having multiple maps produced, where we can really hear from the community about wait, this doesn't make sense, or, and and those are the you know the folks in those communities saying this is problematic for our community based on whatever the reasons being. Um, so we'll have to take all those things, and that's that's why they're drawing the maps, and not us. Yeah. Okay. Dr. McKibben. You know, having been one of those persons that lived on one side of the street and the other side of the street went to another school too, you can mess up communities uh, by by saying, "Okay, you can't cross." There are busy streets that you shouldn't cross. So, it, so it's a slippery slope on that one, and. Uh, and uh, and I wish I had an answer, but I don't. <laughs> I think the boundary, and, and I should know this better, Arden Middle School is a good example. You've got Watt Avenue right there. The other side of it is not Arden Middle School, or a portion of that is not. So kids kids at times can literally see a school, but that's not their home school. Um, I, if, you know, if we drew the boundaries now, they would probably look very different than they would have as we were kind of growing this district. So I think in conclusion on our addition, um, the boundaries, um, you know, this discussion around being inclusive of at least one high school, it would be inclusive of where that physical high school is located. And again, it is at least one high school or more. So more to come on that. I wanna make sure I don't, I'm not hearing any other significant additions at this time. No, we haven't. We haven't gotten quite there yet. Okay, so now um, what I have captured here is Ms. Costa's addition as well, um, which is the new number 11, and Mr. Hernandez's addition and clarification of safety considerations incorporated to number seven. So now we can um, move our discussion to ones we don't want included, and there was primarily discussion around um, item eight. Uh, the boundaries of the trustees areas may consider avoiding pairing two or more incumbents in a single trustee area to the extent legally allowable. Um, I'm going to, I want to open this up for discussion, but I think at least two of us have already indicated a preference to have this removed, a desire to have this removed. Is there any further discussion? Okay. There's a consensus to have um, item eight stricken from the criteria list. Okay. I wanna make sure there's no, nothing else here that we want to consider for removal. Take one last look, no need to. It's a reminder the first three criteria are legally mandated. So those are not on the option list. <laughs> um, seeing none, um, this is an action item. So I'm gonna repeat, let's see. This is an action item to adopt resolution number 3059, clarifying the criteria, the criteria the demographer will consider when preparing draft maps and this is inclusive of Exhibit A, our criteria to guide the establishment of trustee areas, which is as in print with three amendments, which is item number seven, the inclusion of safety considerations, 
removal of number eight and the addition of number 11, the boundaries of the trustee area shall include at least one high school or more. I wanna make sure that there's no questions for staff on capturing all that. We're also on video, so I think we're good. Um, is there um, a motion to adopt the resolution with the criteria as um, amended? So moved. It's been moved by Ms. Costa. Is there a second? Second. It's been seconded by Dr. McKibben. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. That was unanimous. We are now at item C2, tentative agreement with the San Juan Professional Educators Coalition. Superintendent Kern. Thank you, President Viasquez, um, members of the board. Um, I am pinch hitting for Mr. Shoemake, who started his new job in Rescue Union today. Um, so we have a couple tentative agreements coming forward. So I'm presenting the recommendation that the board approve the tentative agreement between the San Juan Professional Educators Coalition and the San Juan Unified School District. This agreement was ratified on June 18 by 89% of the voting SJPEC members. I'd like to state for the minutes that the one-time off schedule payment will not increase employees' base compensation. This is an action item, and at this time I can answer any questions if needed. Thank you. Um, do we have any speakers or comments on this item? Seeing none, do any board members have questions or comments? Seeing none, at the last board meeting, this was a discussion item, and tonight it is an action item. Is there a motion to adopt the tentative agreement between the San Juan Professional Educators Coalition and the San Juan Unified School Districts? It's been moved by Dr. McKibben and seconded by Mr. Hernandez. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. aye. That was unanimous. We are at item C3, tentative agreement with the Teamsters Union Local number 150. I'm presenting the recommendation that the board approve the tentative agreement between the Teamsters Union Local number 150 and the San Juan Unified School District. The Teamsters overwhelmingly approved the tentative agreement and ratified the contract on June 29th. I do not have the exact numbers for that one. Um, I'd like to state for the minutes that the one-time off-schedule payment will not increase employees' base compensation. This is an action item, and at this time I can answer any questions if needed. Thank you, Mr. Kern. We do not have any written comments, um, any speaker cards or written comments on this item. Do any board members have questions or comments? Is there, um, just to note, at the last board meeting, this was a discussion item, and tonight it is an action item. Is there a motion to adopt the tentative agreement between the Teamsters Union Local Number 150 and the San Juan Unified School District? It's been moved by Ms. Costa, and, or Ms. Creason, and seconded by Ms. Costa. No, Mr. Hernandez. Okay. Moved by Ms. Creason, seconded by Mr. Hernandez. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 That was unanimous. We are at item C4, tentative agreement with the San Juan Supervisors Association. Superintendent Kern. I'm presenting the recommendation that the board approve the tentative agreement between the San Juan Supervisors Association and the San Juan Unified School District. This agreement was ratified on June 11th by 83% of the voting supervisors members. I'd like to state for the minutes that this one time off schedule payment will not increase employees base compensation. This is an action item. And at this time I can answer any questions if needed. We do not have any speaker cards or written comments on this item. Do any board members have questions or comments? Seeing none. Um, this was a discussion item at the last board meeting and tonight it is an action item. Is there a motion to adopt the tentative agreement between so, San Juan Supervisors Association, I'm gonna get it up, and the San Juan Unified School District? So moved. It's been moved by Ms. Costa, is there a second? Second. Seconded by Dr. McKibben. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 There being no further items on the agenda, we are adjourned. No, Not for a special meeting. Nope. <clears throat>